Hey everybody, welcome back in the yes, shed. Man. I'm Troy Shaw. And with me, as always, is Mr. Dave Griffiths. What's going on, Dave? How much, Troy? It's an awesome night. I mean, there's awesome and then there's awesome. It's pretty nice nice. It's, it's, we got a pretty awesome nice guy in the shed with us this evening. He is a record producer, drummer, all around great musician, and good friend of the late great David Zajek. And we're going to talk about all kinds of crazy stuff tonight. But uh, we have David Prater in the shed, man. How's it going? Going great. Going great. Yeah, well, I'm glad you made this the, the big up. drive all the way from uh, Salado. Yeah, they're, they're going down 35 this time of night, or God, sometimes even on the weekends, is like driving on the BQE to Long Island. I mean, it's, it's, I keep thinking it's just constant congestion that never seems to end no matter what you do. Well, I was on 317 right before you got to Moody from Belton, mm-hmm. and I was stuck in traffic. It was like it was like 10 miles an hour for like <laughs> when are they gonna 20 get that? minutes. Really? Yeah. When are they going to get that I-35 and Slater down is what I want to know. They finally got that finished, but now they got 35 going through Temple. And see, you got to remember, when I moved to Temple, they were just building that over that uh you know the the split where you it used to be uh underneath that used to be the highway so they built that highway so they could go over all like 57th street 49th and so on and so forth and then now that was two lanes going each way and that, we thought we were <laughs> can i say this shit in tall cotton you know yeah. but um yeah, you can use swear words. You okay, I didn't know if the big seven, you know. You can use the oh. C word. If well, you know. I'm going to try and keep it clean. I'm gonna, you guys got a hard enough job. Well, thanks, Dave, for it. the weather report, and thanks, David, for the traffic report. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm saying is, is there? I, my dad, who built a lot of Temple in, in Fort Hood, he, uh, he was a ready mix contractor, and he told me that they were, years ago, he said, we're going to tear that down, and they're going to build under it. And I thought to myself, God, you mean like a like a tunnel? But no, that's not what it was. They're just going to tear it down and make it like Central Expressway in Dallas. So that's what they're going to do, and that's going to take years, man. Yeah, I don't know. That's going to yeah, take a long to, time. My drive to Austin for the next ten. But anyways, yeah. Once you go ahead, Troy, take it away. So David, uh, you were born and raised in Central Texas, but moved away for a no. while, or no? <laughs> no, I was born in Fort Worth, and um, I moved. My dad was always involved in uh, uh, ready mix concrete, you know, but he, uh, ready mix concrete is where you actually bring all the elements together, the cement, the sand, gravel, and water. That's what you need to do it. And so he always had these plants with the big, you know, silos on the side of the road. He used to have a place on Syntex ready mix you know, going down 35 and right in the middle of uh, town. So he had a concrete company in Fort Worth. He sold out to the day uh to uh, a big outfit out in uh, in fort worth dallas and then he moved uh, outside the non-compete clause 120 mile radius and he came to in 67 we moved from fort worth to temple and that's when it all <laughs> went downhill for me but fort worth was amazing yeah. you know it was during the height of the british invasion and we had teen shows every day um i mean there's always something for kids to do you Who know, are some of the bands you saw back in the day? Oh, God. My first concert was at the Will Rogers uh, Auditorium. It was The Birds, Roki Erickson, 13th Floor Elevator, and Mouse in the Traps with Bugs Henderson. Okay. And uh, that was in 67. Yeah, that was in 67. That's right. Cause so was... Bugs was playing even back then. Oh, right? yeah. Absolutely. I've met Bugs and God Rest His Soul. Great, mm-hmm. great mm-hmm. guitarist. So I'm here in Waco, as a matter of fact, and took my oldest son to see him and got to meet him and get an autograph. But I, oh, I hadn't yeah. seen Bugs with uh, Shuffle Kings and, and a lot of bands when I lived in Well, Dallas. to be honest with you, I've seen him play but didn't even know it was him. But, I mean, he was he was kind of like the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex's David Zajac. He was, way. exactly. But I don't think, you know, there's nobody that could do all the things that David did. My God, I mean... You know, I know that Bo's worked with him a lot, but I've gone much deeper with David than anybody. I mean, just yeah, as we'll far get some, as we'll get some David, David stories later on. But uh, you moved to Temple. How mm-hmm. old were you when you moved to Temple? I, mo- I went to fifth grade at Cater Elementary in Temple, and then um, went to Travis Junior High School to the seventh grade, and then Bonham. When they built Bonham uh, for the eighth grade, so I went there for the eighth and ninth, and then went to Temple, but. 
you know, the it, Temple was just devastating for me because there was nothing for kids to do. And I was in the arts program and was learning to play music. And my brother had played in these, you know, these Battle of the Bands. I always had Battle of the Bands. That was big back then. Yeah, yeah. And I just, Still you is. Know, well, it was really big back then. Yeah. I mean, they would have, you know, they, you'd get to play in the auditorium. You'd, you'd get to go on stage. And, you know, and I remember them explaining. Like Marty McFly. Well, I, re- I remember them saying, well, "Ronnie, Ronnie plays lead, and uh, but such and such, he just plays rhythm." And I thought, "Well, what's what does a lead guitar player do?" And then there was one group. They said, "Well, he doesn't have a bass player, so it's not a real group." So I'm I'm trying to put all that together, you know. And I was in the fourth grade, but it was just exciting, you know. There was a lot of everybody was involved in some sort of extracurricular activity that was fun that wasn't necessarily athletics or you know i mean it was all it was all elective it wasn't expected you know and you didn't have to you know put your body at risk you know like you would if you're playing football or something like that you know so what was the uh, instrument that you took to originally well, well i you know we all took piano lessons is that yeah, there you go and uh, so I didn't really understand what that was all about. It was just, it was very dry. You know, you had your Schribners or Schreibers, whatever it is. You had your elementary basics, and, you know, they'd, you'd learn a little bit about the treble clef and the bass clef, and you'd play real simple little things. And I didn't really understand the applicability of trying to do that and then make it sound like the kinks, you know, or Paul Revere and the Raiders or Herman's Hermits or... My favorite, I love the Dave Clark Five. I liked Eric, I loved Eric Burton. Obviously the Beatles were just, there's no way to explain that to people that didn't go through it. When you were in the, uh, I was, you know, I was in Fort Worth when there was a lot of that. I was in the third grade when Kennedy was assassinated. So I remember it was a, you know, when 1964 came around, it was, it was like the sky just parted. And there was happiness because it was gloomy, man. It was really depressing. It was scary, you know. Uh, there was the, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis when I was a little kid. And for about three or four years, when I was coming up, it was dark. And then when the Beatles came in in '64 in February, they brought love. Well, I mean, it was just, it was just they were, they were incredibly fresh, and they they played live, you know, and uh, they were they were just incredible how they were able to sing in tune and. You know, Paul was just impossibly cute, you know. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't into, you know, uh, uh, any sort of uh, gender dysphoria, so I was still happy being male, but I still thought, man, that guy's just, he's way too cool for school. And Paul, <laughs> of course, John, you know, he was just a, kind of a rebel rouser. And, you know, and really people don't remember, but John sang all the lead, you know. And, and a lot of times, um, Hard Day's Night, uh, Paul sang the bridge. When I'm home, he sang that that high part. Yeah, up until about Rubber Soul and Revolver, I think that John did cover most of the vocals. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, that that was that was hugely important to me, you know. And then when I moved to Temple, there wasn't anybody that played music, and so I started, you know, well, I don't know, what am I going to do? And so I started playing drums. <laughs> It was depressing, you know. We didn't have a. We had to used to have to play on these practice pads that were pieces. You know, they had like a drum. School, were you like, were yeah, you, were we you, didn't even get to play snare drum or anything. Yeah. It was just. It was, it was too loud. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, the racket. So we you had we the, you had a little the rubber mats that went yes. over the, the heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I saw David play in uh, the uh, Town and Country Mall in Temple with his band Spinal Culture, and that was, you know, I want to be in that band someday, you know. It was a, that was the coolest How thing I'd ever How old was David at that time? Probably 17. Yeah, because yeah, I remember he was a local legend then. Where was he living? Was he in Buckholz? He was in Buckholz, yeah. yeah. He had moved from Houston to be in Buckholz, and he kind of went through the same thing I did. It was pretty analogous. Culture analogous. shock, I guess. His culture shock, yeah. I mean, he had to wake up early and tend to the animals, you know, yeah, before yeah. school and stuff, yeah, so. yeah. So once you were, let's say, in high school and stuff, did you did you start did you get in some bands at that time? Or I did, but it was just so there was such a lack of uh, sophistication in terms of uh, people that would, I, 
you know, I mean, it was a big thing if we could start the song together and end together. You know, that was that was kind of the litmus test. If you could do that, <laughs> man, you were awesome. You know, so it's then so, most of the bands we would we get about halfway through the song, and then one of the guys would start soloing and playing like Leslie West and Mississippi Queen, and and then everybody just kind of look at each other and quit playing, and that was the end. <laughs> it was it was very unsophisticated, and it stayed that way up until probably my junior year of high school, and um, I um, everything changed when I went to see Frank Zappa in '73. Yeah, you know, that was my senior year actually, and that's Tiffany. Where, oh, it was more than that. I'd taken LSD. I'd taken like the, I think they called it. Uh, what was that called? It wasn't orange sunshine. I think it was. It was window uh, paint. No, it wasn't window paint. It was just clear light. Yeah. And I mean, but it was so pleasant and and enlightening. And I and I saw Zappa, and I, it was just it, it changed Where'd my life. Where did you see Zappa? Armadillo. Really? He did the uh, he did the so you Halloween. Driving, you were driving down to Austin to go ahead. Yeah, I was seventeen, so I you know I had my license then, and uh, you know, and I got to meet Frank and hang out with him, and then come in the next day for rehearsals, and so I talked to him. You know, uh, I mean, not like a you know thirty minute conversation, but we had changed we exchanged pleasantries, and then I'd see him talking to the musicians. I remember he was in such a foul mood. All he could talk about were these goddamn monitors, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, what are monitors, you know? It's not the PA. What is it? And um, that's when he had Chester Thompson on drums, Ralph Humphreys on drums, Napoleon Murphy Brock. Man, that's... And Jean-Luc Pony was in it? Oh, really? It was Jean-Luc Pony On um, violin. Uh, violin, Ruth yeah. Underwood, Bruce Fowler, and his brother Tom... Napoleon Murphy brought on sax and George Duke, and it wow. was the most incredible band. What a lineup! Oh God, it was. Uh, they opened with. Um, I mean, I'll just never forget it. He came out, and the first thing he did, he says, "Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, he come out and there that stentorian voice of voice of you know Frank Zappa, and he came out and said, um, we got to do a quick sound check." And so he went, the uh, Napoleon, and so he played flute, and then he'd take the sax. And so we went through everybody, and then everything kind of got silent, and he just started kind of stomping his foot on the ground, you know, lightly, like, one, two, three, four. And they started with Inca Rhodes. That's a pretty intricate song. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then it got to the middle section, and, and yeah. uh, everyone was, you had this kind of, this pregnant pause in the audience we were all just listening to you know um you know the whole the, the way the song developed and then it got to the the middle section and then it was like you know the the enterprise taking off you know i mean <laughs> it was just exhilarating and at that point it was just you know the crowd erupted into applause and and from the, then on it was your, 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 one of those concerts your, to where the audience was so intimate, you know. I mean, it was probably fifteen hundred, two thousand people, but everybody was did you just. See, uh, who else did you see at the Armadillo back in the day? Okay, I mean, because oh yeah, the well, I tell you, I got to be good friends with Eric Johnson, and we saw the Electromagnets. Uh, <clears throat> saw them play like four or five times when Eric was just a kid. Well, he was probably, let me see, I was 17, well, I mean, he, and he was probably 21, maybe 22, really? maybe not, maybe 20. He still looks like a kid. Yeah, yeah. Well, he always lived a really um, sensible lifestyle. I mean, he didn't drink or smoke or do drugs, and he was into some sort of spiritual discipline called saint Mont, if I remember. And, um, you know, he, he was just an enlightened guy. I mean, he was he was put on this earth to do exactly what he's doing. Right. So you graduated high school. What did you, Never graduated. Never graduated. Mm -mm. So when you left high school, what did you do? I walked out the front door, got in my Dodge Polaris, and picked David and the band up. We drove to Corpus Christi. And um, <laughs> were you playing I think with, we were you streaked. Playing? I think we all played a set naked on, <laughs> on the beach. We played so you were this. playing with David at that time? Yes. I, <laughs> I had auditioned for him when I was a junior, and uh, I just wasn't quite ready you know um as a drummer yeah yeah and so uh but i kept going to his shows and i would find out wherever they were going to play they had already come back from california at that point 
where they did that um, that that poster of them doing some sort of a uh, endorsement and a demo with Alltech Lansing. What year was this? That was probably 72, 73, something like that. And then they came back and they went from playing out of double Marshall stacks and David and uh, they, they went to high powered kind of combo amps, you know, uh, like a, uh, you know, not a Fender Twin, he was playing out of an Ampeg. And then Stan was playing out of a. It was. It was at that point. It's too close. It was perfect. It was good. Yeah, Stan was. Um, Stan Davis was in this band. The, David had a band called Zai. It was T Z I A H Zai, and uh, Mac Ward was on drums, and Cliff Brightwig was on uh, keyboards, and a guy named Neil. God, I think his name was Neil Gunn. From, I, I don't know exactly, but he, he was on bass. It wasn't Kyle Pilgrim. What was Sam playing? Guitar. They had okay. two guitars. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Sam was playing, I think, a black and white SG. Sam was real mod looking at that time. I mean, he was a lady killer, man. He was. <laughs> <laughs> woo! Now he's just a farm boy. <laughs> Farmer. Well, that and yep. more. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but so anyway, I kept going to see David play mainly here in Waco at the Abraxas. And then little different gigs around town, but mainly the Abraxas. They just tore that place up. I mean, my God. I mean, there were just some nights there that were, you know, it where, was, where was, it where was the, like a pep Where rally. was the Abraxas? Where was that? The, I think it was on the old Highway 677. Wasn't it up there by Leslie's Fried Chicken where that was? I don't know. Before my time. Before my time, too. Yeah, yeah it was uh, owned by uh, some Spanish guys. You know, so, but it wasn't, you know, there wasn't any sort of animosity between the Mexicans and Hispanics. Everybody was just in the music, man. It was, it wasn't any, I never saw any fights or anything like that. There was another band that I went to see a lot called, there was a guy named Gary Myrick from Dallas in a band called Slip of the Wrist and then Cracker Jack. Gary was a lead singer in Cracker Jack, and I think Stevie Ray was in that too. Yeah, I heard of Myrick before. Yeah, Gary was Gary was a force to contend with at one time in the 80s. He did that album with John Waite, No Breaks, that had yeah. Missing You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary, Gary right, played right. all that record. Gary, Gary who? Gary Myrick, okay. M-Y-R-I-C-K. Yeah, okay. yeah, I've heard that name. Yeah, he's a real, real artistic guy. He's a great painter and a kind of a handsome, you know, kind of uh, Renaissance man. You kind of a Renaissance man. He always had cool outfits and cool guitars, you know. So he had this whole stylistic thing about him. You know, he just didn't show up in, you know, tennis shoes and and a soiled t shirt. And I mean, he looks smart, you know. Yeah. Kind of like Jimmy Vaughn used to look back right, then. Right. Yeah. So you got in the car with Zacek and his band and went to Corpus, Corpus Christi? Well, the original band was Henry Coro on guitar, Kyle Pilgrim on bass, Benny Silva on saxophone, uh, Sonny Ortiz, um, the guy that is now the founder and r continuing with uh, Widespread Panic. He was from Waco, and his yeah. name, he goes by the name Domingo now, which means Sunday. So... <laughs> Sabato Domingo. <laughs> you know what? I think I know about him because I was buying um, some CDs at the HEB in Woodway a while back. Mm -hmm. I was checking out. You were buying I was, what? I was buying. They were CDs. What is that? <laughs> got back this asshole. <laughs> Anyways, there was a bunch of. Um, they were like selling them for nothing, mm -hmm. like three bucks a piece. I got an Almond Brothers. And I got all these. Oh yeah. I grabbed the whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And I was checking out, and this gal that was there she's like um oh yeah yeah i like these mm -hmm. she goes my uh, cousin mm -hmm. plays for widespread panic yeah mm -hmm. and she was hispanic yeah mm -hmm. and i was like no shit i've i've seen them and she's and it was funny because um it's got to be the same person yeah yeah oh no question yeah it's it's sunny i mean he, I, yeah, yeah. i'll always call him sunny but he hadn't gone gone by sunny in 40 years you know yeah, because uh, she saw my Almond Brothers, and she said, you know, the O'Teal and all those guys, that, you know, whatever. Yeah, but, they but, really uh, cross-pollinated yeah. in between uh, a government mule yeah, right. and then the Butch Trucks, Almond Brothers, all of that. They were kind of... Uh, yeah, it's a part of the jam band scene. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, she, I, I don't know. I think she still works at H-E-B. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, anyway, man. Everybody's got to do something. Out, but, anyways, it's funny you mention that. 
So anyway, Sonny, uh, he was kind of, he, he played congas, you know, and that was about it. He may have had an Fouché Kavasa, you know, that looks like a bunch of steel chains and you yeah, yeah, rub it yeah. across your uh -huh. hand. And maybe maracas, tambourines, and congas, you know, that's that was what he did. But it wasn't a, I never, him and I never like worked out parts or anything. He was just kind of set up over to the side and had a mic up. And so, knock yourself out, man. Just yeah. don't get my way. <laughs> and, uh, and so, he also did the equipment and um, so it was basically Kyle, David, myself, uh, Benny and Henry and then Sonny would have made the sixth and so back then if we made twelve to fifteen hundred dollars for a week you know each one of us would make two hundred yeah let me get one two hundred two hundred and fifty bucks you know and but Sonny we had to pay him something so Oh, it's awful. I mean, we paid him like 90, 100 bucks. And I'll never forget in the end, one time Kyle came up to me and he was just pissed off. You know, because I was kind of running the finances and stuff. And I was the youngest guy in the band. But I was very ambitious. Um, so anyway, what happened is uh, Sonny was just, he, he was, I mean, he, he wasn't crying. He, he, he was so hurt. And he said, "You got to, man. We got to pay him an, you know, an equal share. I mean, he's working so hard." And I looked, and he just looked beat up. And I said, "I can't do this. Of course, so, take take it, Sonny. I'm sorry, you know." And I have every time I've ever talked to Sonny, I, I still beg him to forgive me. You know? <laughs> I do, you know. Um, but then he got back at me because you know he's making just ridiculous sums. Of, I mean, that band played like two weeks sold out at the Beacon Theater in Manhattan and so you know they've done really well but there's a huge difference between what they do and then trying to produce Dream Theater and Firehouse and Night Ranger and some of the other bands that I've let's done. Let's talk about some of that. Let's, talk, that, let's talk about how did, how did you let's get, do it. get involved with Santana? Oh, okay. <laughs> so what happened is I um, it started with David uh, and, and what had happened is word was kind of getting around that Mac Ward, the drummer that they had, and Mac was a good drummer, and I liked Mac. He was a, he was a sweet guy, but he was really into motorbikes. You know, he was a he was he, you know he was into biking. You know, I mean, but like as a lifestyle. You know, back in the day, back in the early seventies, and he just kind of wanted to get out of it. He just wasn't really into it anymore. And word got to me that hey, David, you know, he might want to you know have you come in and play, and so. I don't know. I, can't, I think I may have just come in and played a gig, or, or just rehearsed and played a bunch of the songs. With, and by that point, with, I was with David or with Carl? yeah, no, with with David. But I'm getting to that yeah. because it'll tell you how I got to All that. Because right. I was in that for about a year, not quite two years. I I stayed in that all through '74 all through '75 and then it became apparent that I was not somebody that. I wasn't going to stick around. I mean, I just hated it here, you know, back then. And <laughs> things haven't changed a whole lot. <laughs> but anyway, um, but you're here tonight. Well, I'm, I am, I am absolutely here tonight, ready to let you know whatever you want to know. And what happened? We were playing the library down on Fifth Street, uh, over there by uh, Baylor, just across from the main entrance. And uh, a guy came in that David knew, who has now passed away. His name's Jasper Hutchinson. And he was called Hutch Hutchins. And this guy was uh, just a specimen. I mean, he was like, kind of like a young Warren Beatty, just good looking. You know, women just would see him and, you know, just practically, you know, spill their drink in front of him. So, you know, he would say, oh, I'll get it, you know. And, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, he was, he had just this, he, he looked like, you know, like the lion and the lion king, you know, uh -huh. the, the main guy. He just had this massive mane of hair and he was in this thing, the, tr the, the touring cast of hair. Give me a head with hair. All of them. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, what happened is I started talking to him. He said, yeah, man, I'm living in Marin County in Mill Valley, and uh, I'm working at SIR. I said, what's that? Said, oh, it's a big rehearsal place. They're all over the United States. I said, okay, SIR. Uh, at Studio Instrument Rentals. Oh, okay. So he worked the front desk there. 
And he said, hey, man, you ought to come out. It's really great. I'm working with John Cipollina from Quicksilver. And as it turns out, Mario Cipollina, who had big, long hair, and and, uh, that was the bass player that later was in Huey Lewis and the News. The guy with the glass and just stands back there. Well, that was like a a character that he developed, kind of like Bunny Carlos. You know, he developed this kind of a caricature, and that was great. I mean, more people should do that. Bunny Carlos should still be with Cheap Trick. I don't know. They had a serious, serious falling out. Yeah, I know. But anyways, they play. He played at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with him. He so did well. I mean, they should they should patch it all up. I mean, they were so good together. But I mean, after how many decades they they did what they did, you know, everything gets kind of stale. But it was something about the use of the name, you know. But so. back to your story. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I went out to San Francisco. Um, I think I played. We David and I played uh, the first of the Sefstic Hall in late '74. Uh, I think we played once or twice, and then we did the Christmas thing, and it was huge. I mean, it was just the energy for some reason at that place from day one. It was just this big release, and it was really kind of messed up because out there they still have to stop playing at midnight yeah so in the summer (laughs) well they do in sunday nights you can go till one but actually they can play as long as they want they just can't serve after the cutoff so you know if you get everything off the table the only problem is byob so people are still drinking crown and whatever you know just about everybody in there had their own flask you know in a brown bag right exactly no telling nowadays what else is in that brown bag (laughs) but anyway the the uh I got real, you know, and we played from 74. We were the first people. I was told later by Alice that there had been a couple of kind of, uh, kind of uh, just gatherings with the little music, but it wasn't like people came in with a PA. And we came in with a PA and we just were, we were ready to invade Poland. You know, we'd already taken Czechoslovakia. I mean, we were, (laughs) we were like the Wehrmacht. You know, so anyway. I like that. Yeah. No, it was, um, you know, we played, like I I put on that post last night, we played with a tremendous amount of attack, you know. And David, one thing that him and I just immediately uh, bonded with is, you know, we went at it. And when he would start soloing, I would go off with him. and And it was everyone else's job just to keep up. And so, and the crowd really would, you know, feed off of that. And then David was tremendously affected by the enthusiasm of the crowd. And it was a symbiotic thing. He'd start playing more for them. And then they'd like, God damn, I check, yeah! And then, you know, by the end of it, they were just screaming, I check! <laughs> and, uh, and, and that like, went on. He was like that up until the end. Until the, he, he was playing like that even when he had a bag, you know, and yeah, it was no, just, he was so ill, poor thing. So anyway, um, we prop, and then we did an outdoor, uh, I had booked a, you know, I got my father to bring a semi out there next to the, uh, Sefsta call and we did a, you know, an outdoor festival and that devolved into basically just a massive melee. I mean, it started off with a couple of women just duking it out next thing i know all the security that we had hired from colleen like a private security <laughs> force they were just sitting on their thumbs and then about 9 30 all hell broke loose and we and then the, of course some knucklehead didn't distribute the power amongst all the outlets we just put everything into one including the lights and so we got about to the third song and it all went, and so the, you know it was it didn't go off that good so that was in the summer and then um We played a couple more times, and then I just, I had had it. I mean, you know, there was members of the band that wanted, by that time, we were playing just ridiculous music. We were playing Van McCoy's The Hustle, you know, and we would jam on the average white band, pick up the pieces and stuff. You know, we were playing dance music. We were playing the Ohio Players, and then we'd play some trapeze, but... Some guys in the band wanted to become a show band, wanted us to all wear matching suits, you know, polyester. And, you know, I was like, hell no. You know? So, and so that's, that's why I left. Back and, to Carlos. 
what happened is that when I saw when I saw Hutch come in that night, I said, "Okay, well, if you're out there," and it was about Christmas time in '75, and I basically told the band that I I was done, you know, and um, I had a share in the band's equipment, and so uh, we had taken out a loan with my father, and so. Um, we had paid that off, and so when I was um, going going to leave, they said, "Well, we'll you know, since I own part of the PA, they were going to buy my interest out." And I got about oh, I don't know, fifteen, sixteen hundred bucks, and uh, and I and I left and got my Tradesman one hundred van, seventy five Tradesman one hundred E one hundred, and uh, drove out to San Francisco. And the night I got there, it snowed. The first time in a hundred years, so I, oh, I didn't. Shit. Yeah, I didn't know. And the, the guy, I, and Hutch was with me. He was like, "Oh man, this is unbelievable." And I'm thinking, "Man, it's just snow, you know." <laughs> and, it, and it was really just kind of like a dusting. It didn't no accumulation. It was just you know, it was snowing, but it wasn't even sticky. And so, when I got there, I went up to the house that they had in Mill Valley. It was this strange house, and I went there. And there was something really weird going on. And Nick, believe it or not, Nicky Hopkins was the keyboard player. Kid. So Nicky was there, and I was learning piano. So at one point, him and I sat there, and I said, hey, what do you think of this? And I played a little something. And he said, Because well, you were a piano guy. Well, I was just trying. To, I, I had decided that I was going to learn as much about music as I could after seeing Zappa. So I was taking piano lessons from a, a girl named Karen Wilson at Mary Harden Baylor. And um, and then she left. And that, oh, that, unfortunately, I had to end that. But the point is, is I was really, I wanted to learn everything that I could. So when I went out there, there was all these guys, but nobody was playing. But they were talking. And I couldn't figure out what they were talking about because it didn't make any sense. And then as it turns out, this guy comes in and he's got a girl with him and all of a sudden everybody gets real excited to see him. Well, it was the Coke dealer. Everybody was just there. They were just whacked out and blow. And I got <laughs> and I got there and I had done Coke a couple of times with Hutch when he was in Austin. And I thought, you know, it's pretty cool, you know, um, <laughs> but I didn't, you know, was not a household word back then. And I got there, and I'll never forget, you know, this guy comes out, and he dumps about an ounce onto a big picture frame or something, and he says, yeah, it's your turn. And I'm, you know, I don't even remember how I did it with David. You did your Tony Montana. <laughs> no, I mean, I just looked at it, and he says, you know, I mean, it was kind of like, what do I do? Do I, do I do I eat it? Or, you know. <laughs> You're right. And the guy says, you don't know how to do this? And then one of the girls with him just thought I was so cute. I didn't know. <laughs> and so I got a straw, and, you know, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Okay, just wait a minute. All right. Well, yeah. Well, anyway. And then they never really, they never, it was supposed to be a rehearsal. Nobody ever played. They just kind of, <laughs> John would go tinker with his equipment a little bit and so hit Carlos, another two. And Carlos still isn't here at this uh, No, but this is important <laughs> to understand. And so I found myself, for the first two months I was there, I was living at this place called the Fireside Inn, and next door to me was a Coke dealer. And everybody that I knew was just in the coke, and I thought this is bull, man. I didn't want anything to do with it, believe it or not. And um, so that's when I started playing with these just pathetic. I started playing the first band I was in with, with Bonnie Hayes, who turned. She wrote four of the songs on that nick of time with Bonnie Raitt's her CD. All right, sure. But she was she was she was probably twenty, and I was nineteen, something like that. I was nineteen at that point. So anyway, what happened is, I did that for about, uh, I did that for about six months. I got out there, something like February fifteenth, something like that, and I drove out there. And um, you know, if you've ever driven across the United States into Northern California, and then you start to hit those hills. It just, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. There is no place I'd ever been that looked like that, and. Um, 
So I was really didn't have any bearings, and I was just trying to figure out, well, you know, San Francisco was so congested and so crowded and expensive. Still is. Oh, it's worse, much worse now. But <laughs> I lived in San Rafael in the Bermuda Palms, and, um, you know, you could rent a room by the month there. So anyway, I was I was in and around kind of picking up whatever gigs that I could and played in a couple of bands, lived down in the peninsula and... and uh, uh, in uh, I think it was uh, Foster City down in the peninsula over by Redwood City and Daly City I think and uh, it wasn't that far from where uh, Steve Jobs had his garage and was they were just starting up all that stuff sure. and so anyway then at one point I was uh, doing a gig with the songwriter a publishing demo at CBS Records studio CBS had a uh, Columbia Records had their offices right across the street from SIR. I mean, you could open the door to SIR and throw a football and somebody in the front door, CBS, catch it. It was literally just across the street. And so, you know, Sly, and, Sly and, from Sly and the Family Stone, he would be in SR, and then I'd see him across the street in the record company's uh, studio or in the lobby and whatnot. So I'm thinking, well, I'm getting close. And then we rehearse, and then the next day we come in, we're going to do the tracking, and I see all this equipment in there, and it says Santana. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, man, how cool is that? And what I see, year is this? It's 76. This is February 76. Okay. So and, Michael Shreve's already out. Yeah, he was out. Carlos had already gone through that love, devotion, surrender. He had had yeah. about three years of just nothing. You know, I mean, he, is that is that before? Uh, well, it's after Moonflower, then, is it? No, it was way before Moonflower. Way before. Moonflower. Way before. Yeah. That was Moonflower was like yeah, seventy eight. Seventy eight. You're right. No, this was. Uh, he had just done uh, Amigos. Okay. That had Europa on yeah. it and Dance Sister Dance. Yeah, exactly. And so, anyway, I talked to this. He was a real heavy set guy with a ponytail. He was with him for years. All those guys were with him for years that I met it, over the next few days. And I asked the guy, I said, well, do you know Carlos? <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, we're just in town auditioning a, a new band. Carlos wants a new band. Um, really? Um, who's he auditioning? Oh, uh, oh uh, congas, timbales, bass player, so a lead Coke, singer, Coke and, and oh, and drums. Yes. Escovitos weren't. No, 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 uh, -uh. no. They, they, uh, the, the, this band had Bobby Vega, I think, who had been the bass player. He died not long after that. He was, he was heavily into heroin. Right. And uh, I think Leon Patillo had been in it. Uh, M Michael, no, no. I think Indugu, uh, Leon Chancellor had been in Santana before. I know he had. So he this was, the, was before Alex Leakerwood and all those singers. Were yes, on there? that was uh, that on the next record. Um, what was that guy's name? David Williams or something? There's a big tall. No, Greg. Greg. Yeah. That was his name. And well, they big, had the black singer. Yeah, big, while. tall, handsome yeah. guy. Really nice guy. Missing uh, like two joints on his uh, uh, finger, his index finger. I'll never forget that. I just looked at him so like, wow. So you. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, Fast what happened, forward. yeah, I auditioned, came in the next day. Uh, what happened is I asked this guy, I said, how do I, how do I get an audition? And he said, well, I can, you, know, you can call the offices. I said, well, how do I do that? You got the phone number? Yeah. He gives me the number, and I reach in my pocket, and I get a dime out or a nickel, whatever it used to cost back then. <laughs> and I, I think it was a nickel. And I called up Ray Etzler, who was his personal manager. And Ray answered, you know, say, uh, uh, this is David Prater. I'm calling for the audition for Santana. And the woman answered the phone and just, you're what? Yeah, I'm calling about the audition. Well, it wasn't even public yet. So I had gotten, I was the first guy. And when Ray yeah. picked up the phone, he said, who is this? Uh, my name's David Prater. Who told you to call? And it was, well, I can't remember this guy's name, uh, the, uh, the, the roadie with him. And he said, all right, yeah, yeah, we are holding auditions. Uh, and if you want to audition, I need to ask you some questions first. And basically it went like this. He said, now you do understand 
that you'll be auditioning for Carlos Santana. Do you know who Mr. Santana is? I said, absolutely. And he said, do you understand? I'll never forget to use the word gamut. He said, do you understand the gamut of music that you have to be able to play to play with Carlos? And I said, I certainly do. And he said, well, let me just, if, if you aren't up to the task, you need to be very honest with yourself and with me because if not, it's going to be very embarrassing for you to come in there. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm, I'm ready to go. I said, okay, be there, bring your stuff. I, there were no drum set up. So I was playing in a band at the airport lounge at the San Francisco International Airport. So when you heard that, were you, were you confident enough in your chops? To be well, I got the go? gig the next day. Well, I came in and played. Went. And when I came in and played, it was there was this incense and patchouli oil. I mean, it smelled right. like you were in some sort of a Moroccan harem or something, you know. And uh, But Carlos was into that spiritual thing at that time, and he was not doing any pot or drugs. Or no, no, he was no. clean as a whistle. Clean as a whistle. And so... Anyway, it was Tom Coster on keyboards from the uh, yeah, Barbada, Bar yeah. uh, Barbada, I think, that, or Barbarello, that's the name yeah. of that. And uh, I came in, and no, there were no drums. Carlos was playing bongos or congas. John Santos was playing timbales. Raul Rico, who passed away last year, was playing uh, congas as well. A guy named Pablo Telez from this band Malo, who was George Santana's band, uh, Carlos's brother. Yeah. He was a good guitar player. And um, and then a guy that was the brother of the bass player from Rat, and his name was Tom Crucier. There was one Crucier that was in uh, um, uh, Rat. Rat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway. Um, you know, I think Ray said, yeah, he kind of motioned, like, get your shit, come over here, you know, be quiet, don't make a fuss. You know, I came in there with my my clear, my clear acrylic Ludwig Vistalite drums, and I had five sticks, I think, that's all I had. I didn't have a stick bag, I just had them in my back pocket. I didn't have hardly any clothes, I had some green double-knit pants <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a lime green shirt. But that was in style back then. Um, I wasn't stylish, no, no. I mean, I looked just like exactly what I was, right. just corn-fed. But I was really strong. And um, so I got my stuff set up and, you know, boom, boom, you know. And then Carlos, he puts his pick in his mouth goes over puts his guitar on he's playing out of a two boogie amps he's got the he's got the little 12 watt combo on top and underneath it on this this stand he was the early adopter of the mesa boogies it, yeah he was him and uh, eric johnson yeah yeah, yeah. and uh and so what happened? Was he playing the Yamaha. He double was playing cut? that Yamaha double cutaway yeah. that and I and I played a lot of guitar with Carlos, and he was. Um, that thing had to weigh 35 pounds. Yeah, right. It was, I mean, really. I mean, it's so heavy that many people, you know, it just... It's a great guitar. It's a great guitar, and it's sustained for... Yeah, yeah, for days. So, he came over, got his guitar, kind of clunk, 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 you know, and then... And he's just comping, and they're cooking it, and I'm just going like, holy shit. It was like being in the Cronk gym with Thomas Hearns and all these, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, the Spanish <laughs> boxers, and I'm in there, you know. And it's kind of like, all right, you know, it's time, my time to start hitting the bag with them. <laughs> nice so, analogy. Oh, it, 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 it was. I mean, everybody was just, you could smell what the, the, what was, you could smell the food that ate coming out of their pores. It was hot in there. And everybody's sweating, and it just looked like everybody was just having sex. I mean, you know, because the, the, the timbali players, you know, and then, and it just, there was this just ungodly racket. And then Carlos, he looks at me, and I'll never forget, I was playing, you know, I started playing this beat, and he looked at me like, Wow. Okay, white boy. You, got <laughs> yeah, right you know, you got some shit. And so, 
Well, then he walks. To, he walks. Boy, boy, so yeah, yeah. yeah but exactly. but there, but uh, yeah. Leon Chancellor was not. He was mm-hmm. he was you know the hood. Right, right. And so anyway, Carlos walks into the middle of the room. He just goes, <laughs> and all of a sudden it's just like <clears throat> somebody dropped the clutch, and we were just gone. And what song was it? We, we this is a whole other conversation. It was a jam. There was no song. All right, we were just cooking. That's the way music used to be. We didn't yeah. say, okay, let's play uh, Mustang Sally, you know, yeah, right. or let's play the Black Crows. Do, da, da, yeah. dun, 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 dun. No, hell no. No, we played because we could play. Freeform riffing. Well, it was more just kind of like trying to create a tapestry and then Tom would come in and do his stuff, you know, keyboard wise. And then sure. and then Carlos would play some melodic things and Carlo, and then Tom would go, oh, well, this chord would go nice with that, you know. So it was really more jazz. Sure. And, uh, but loud. You know, this is when Weather Report had done Mysterious Traveler. So, you know, there was a real experimental... Um, yeah, that was philosophy. 75, 75, 76. Yeah. That was Chick yeah, yeah. Corea, as Mob Vishnu Orchestra, yeah, and Zappa, and I was right in there with all those yeah. guys. And uh, so, anyway, we played for about 30 minutes. And at that point, this is, you're not going to believe this. I'm in there playing, and I'm going like, this is. This can't be happening. You know, I was in high if school. If only somebody had a cell phone with a camera <laughs> yeah, on it, you right. could right. video. Well, people say, like, yeah, sure, you were in Santana. You got any pictures? Hell no. I didn't have a stick bag. <laughs> Even if I had a camera, I couldn't have got the film developed. So, you know, I mean, what are you talking about? And you, and I'll tell you one thing. It was, it, was, it was like, you know, working in the White House and wanting to take a picture of the president every day. You don't do that. You know, I mean, that's disrespectful. And so, you know, you don't say, hey, Carlos, you know, you know, you don't take selfies. I mean, <laughs> you know, because it was very apparent that this is Carlos Santana and you ain't, you know. Right. And so you didn't just come in there and try and try and start hamming it like people would nowadays. And so anyway, this went on for a week. And my wife was there the first day or so. And she saw that she lives in Temple, my ex-wife, Jamie. And so um, what happened was that all of a sudden these people started walking in. And out of the corner of my eye, I'm going, oh, no, no, that's not him. Oh, my fucking God. Bill Graham walks in because he was his manager. And Bill Graham, you don't understand this, but if you were a kid growing up in the 60s and the 70s, Bill Graham... He was was the greatest promoter of all time. All time. I mean, he... He, he, the things that he did were just amazing. I mean, he cre- he had the Fillmore East and Fillmore West and Winterland and Day on the Green, all of these massive, massive shows. And he was behind, you know, involved with the dead and, you know, just an ama- the most charismatic man I've ever met, ever. I mean, he walked in and it was like, okay, whatever was happening before, it's my room now. You he know? died too young. Yeah. So what happened then was he came in, and then all of a sudden I'm looking. Oh, oh, wait a minute, that's Greg Rowley from Journey. And then Ainsley Dunbar comes in, and then so, Ross Va- and it was Journey. They were rehearsing yeah, next door, right? And then I see Emilio Castillo. This was after this was after uh, Neil Sean and Greg Rowley had left Carlos, right? And started Journey. Journey, and they had done that one album with all of them like flying, you know, with their feet off. Yeah, the yeah, ground. yeah. Hello, Fort Hood. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like life. Form, yeah, yeah. Actually. Let's uh, get a little flyover. But yeah, that was a that was a pretty. Um, jam heavy album that first journey album yeah i mean you know i don't remember it like i i do when steve joined the band I mean, the point i'm making so bill graham walks in i'm thinking oh my god you know <laughs> i mean you know it was like uh, charlton heston moses you know yeah. and then uh and then all my heroes greg you know the organ solo on soul sacrifice at woodstock right, you know, he's there right. and then neil from you know the santana three and oh my god and then I see Ainsley, and I see Ross. Then I see all of Tower Power walk in. Emilio Castillo, uh, Lenny Pickett, Holy and all shit. those guys. And so now you got Journey, you got Tower Power, and then you got Bill Graham. And they're all standing in a little semicircle, just 
smoking cigarette, watching us, and going like, hey, man, this, you know, and they were all like shaking their heads like, yeah, they were even pointing at us like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and then Automatic Man walks in, and that's Michael Sree's band. And they were, there was five bands rehearsing. We had like Studio A. And uh, so Michael Shreve walks in, and it's Michael Bayette, uh, I think at Jerome. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Was the, Michael still on good terms with Carlos at that point? I never really heard much about it, you know. I mean, because I, I know he left. You know, he yeah, played Woodstock, he, and he was with them for. But he had already been there through, five or six years. He was probably. He was on Abraxas and Caravan Seri, right? Caravanserai. No, he was on uh, Abraxas, and he's on the third record, um, and then he was on uh, 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 Welcome. Remember that one, the white. Yeah. And there's a beautiful. There's some beautiful things on that record, and uh, I love Michael's playing. He was a huge influence on me. You know, yeah. really, really. I just, you know, first of all, to see that white kid playing his butt off. And like he's still that. playing. You know, I, I don't know if you've seen the recent uh, video of. I Carlos, mean, uh, yeah, with the with the right. you know four was the Carlos, original guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Neil Neil's actually well, they're all yeah. still alive, you know, yeah, they and, are. and they're all doing they're good. Alive. Greg's doing Greg's, good. Greg looks great. Mm -hmm. Greg looks better than he's ever looked. Really, yeah, he does. But anyway, um, I never got any sense that anyone was on bad terms with Carlos. There was never Carlos never spoke ill of anyone. That was just <laughs> that was not going to happen. And um, including you, I hope. No, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story that's really wild here in a minute. So, what happened is these guys are all watching us, and then walks Carlos's former percussionist, Mingo Lewis. And this guy was a big Central American guy. He almost, I mean, he was just, he was like George Foreman. And, uh, you know, he was very, very machismo. And he, he, him and his band were rehearsing. So anyway, this room, there must have been like 15, 20, maybe more musicians in the room with my wife in the back smoking Marlboro Lights sitting on the couch just, you know, with her arms just like that, keeping herself, you know, trying to keep, keep shit together. <laughs> and um, we played for about 30 minutes and everybody was just jumping up and clapping and you know it was amazing that went on for a week and then i was ray Esler came in and he said well and he extended his hand he said welcome to the family and he gave me i think a w-2 and he said i want you to fill this out and here's your application for Blue Cross Blue Shield. I said, well, what is that? You know, well, it's health insurance. And I said, well, I don't need that. You know? Man, that was pretty awesome that it had. Oh, yeah. And I had a, the first retainer was, I think, 375 And when you're on the road, it was 750 something like that. So I took my first paycheck and I went out and got a stick bag. <laughs> you know? I think it was $25. I was shitting in tall cotton, let me tell you. You should have got a camera. Yeah, there's no camera. And um, he's a little Texas boy that's just happy to get a stick bag. Oh, I, I happen to nail the hottest gig in the United States, yeah. sight unseen. And then the next thing you knew, Rolling Stone came out the next week talking about the new band. And then I got calls from home saying, Is it true? Is what true? Are you really in Santana? Yeah. You know, ah! You know, and the, 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 you'd hear uh, dial tone like that. So when I came home, you know, uh, five or six months later, it was like the conquering hero kind of. But um, but that only lasted uh, about a month. We were rehearsing and getting ready. At that time, there was the 1980, I mean, 1976 Olympics, I think. That would be the Montreal. one where Bruce Jenner won the uh, yeah. won the decathlon. I mean, Sugar I'm Ray sorry. Sugar Ray yeah. was a gold uh, yeah. Olympic gold medalist yeah. that year, so he it was he was all over it, and it was him. And um, I think um, yeah, that was uh, Ms. Ms. Jenner <laughs> won the decathlon. Right? Yeah, that, that was. Uh, uh, oh, hold it a second. And of oh, course, yeah. John Belushi did that great. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, but he's having like the donuts and smoking cigarettes. Yeah, smoking cigarettes and having <laughs> yeah. beer, I think. Yeah, right. Anyway. So anyway, what happened is the band that I gave my notice to that I had been at the airport lounge in San Francisco International, 
Well, they had never found a drummer. So when I got fired, well, the whole band got fired because Why? what the record producer, David Rubinson, who'd done the last record, he came in the last week and he was there to just, to, he was there to fire people. I mean, it was obvious. This guy was. So you never got to go on not, the road? No, we were going on the road the next week. We never were got to record or go on the road? No, I got a great uh, tape of us playing in rehearsal that I'm going to put on my website. But, uh, I mean, it's a, it's an incredible tape. You got to hear this thing. I mean, and it's really clear. I was already into recording, so I had I'm dying a little, to hear it. Yeah, I had two. I went up to the front desk and I said, um, "Do you can you get me two microphones and cables with quarter inch ends?" And so he gave me two fifty sevens, and I kind of put one in between Carlos and me on the left, and the other one between Pablo and the percussion. And just and I didn't have headphones, and so I just kind of had to wing it. And sure enough, it worked. And um, so anyway, that's the only uh, thing that I have to show for it. So and I was cr I was crushed. I bet. I mean, so what did you do then? Had to beg for my old gig with that band back because oh, uh, they didn't have a drummer. And then about a month later, we got this call from this guy, Art Wall, I think was his name. He was a booker on the uh, cabaret circuit, and we were pl we were a cabaret band. We did we did two dance sets and then two show sets and the singer Karen Dumont was just Jehovah's Witness Where you? Well, singer it was called Karen Dumont and the new creation where from were you the, playing we you know it was supper club shit like that alright you know, yeah, I got you awful well, let's, we, fa let's fast forward to you played with Brian Setzer well let me tell you this after I we, we went to the I had to drive all the way across the east coast about a month later and we were playing these just horrible gigs and we played in Austin New York and Sing Sing and I heard about an audition for LaBelle when I was in New York City one day and uh, and nobody I was in there with my band the, the, we had all come down to New York City to go to 48th Street the famous music row you know all the music stores so I went to buy a big six inch snare drum I always wanted a fat snare drum I got a Slingerland six and a half inch snare drum and then I heard about this audition for LaBelle and uh, and I thought, God, I better get the number, but I can't. The whole band's in there. That that'd be terrible. So I, so I I figured it. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to give the ticket to get my car out of parking. Either he's going to pull up the car, and then I'm going to tell everybody I left something, and, and I'm going to go and I'm going to make a phone call. So I went and made a phone call, and a famous songwriter, as it turns out in later years, Ellen Shipley. Um, she answered the phone and I said, hi, I'm David Prater. I was, I've just been in Santana and I w I'd like to audition for LaBelle. So did uh, Patty treat you right? Yeah, well, I went and she wasn't there. So I came in and what happened is uh, she said, well, they've already hired a drummer. But I don't think that they started rehearsals yet. I'll go ask and see if I can get you in. Now you're in San. You'd been in Santana, right? And I said, "Yes, ma'am. I most certainly have." What? Still wet behind the ears, and um, so a guy gets on the phone. It's Ken Reynolds, and he says, "Come in two o'clock tomorrow." So go back to Austin, Inc., play that gig that night. Get up early in the morning. Go to this audition. Walk in, and it's just the band. It's just the backup band. And um, so basically, what happened? I had to. Do, it was a drum off. I didn't know it. This white guy sitting on the flight cases over there, that was the drummer, Gary, that had just been hired. And so the, the music director came up and he said, I want you to play this pattern. It was like a doom, 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 kind of like a New Orleans type of thing, like an Alan Toussaint groove. But it was. Meters. Yeah, but it wasn't like doom, 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 doom. It was doom, it was a dotted eight thing. So that requires a certain kind of suppleness, you know. You gotta have some groove to play that. And this other guy said, Okay, you come up here and play it. And I went, Oh my god, that's brutal. You know, so he comes up and he just freezes. He was like he just couldn't do it. Wasn't in the pocket. Wasn't happening. And so he said, Okay, very good, play another thing. And so I did that. This went on for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I mean, it was awkward, you know, because I want the gig, and this other guy wants the gig, and we're having to try and knock each other off, but still be a gentleman, and like, it's here, like Battle know. of the Bands. That's all exactly over. what it was. <laughs> right. Battle of the Drums. <laughs> yeah, right. And they had already had this massive cattle call, you know, right. been in the Village Voice, they had 70, 80 guys all waiting out in the lobby, you know, with the stick. 
some guys, this guy that came in at the drum store and said he had just been to the audition, he said, man, I got in there and all I did was take my sticks out of my bag. And they said, thank you very much. Because <laughs> he was a Spanish guy with thick glasses, you know, and he had a yeah. big fro. And, and he was a postal worker. His name was Herman Badillo. And uh, poor guy. But anyway, um, so I played and everybody left and they went outside. And, and, and at this time... It was just Jose Rossi, the percussionist, and me. And I said, well, there's... And I, in, my, in my conniving little mind, I said, I bet you they're outside waiting to see what we're going to do. So I started playing... The, it's, it's called a wah wah cone. Ding, ta, 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 you know, a thing I'd, I'd learned with Carlos. And then that's like... You know, all the, it's like right. the Kentucky Derby. You know, all the horses start running. Well, the percussionist hears that and he starts playing. And then from outside, it sounds like we are just, it sounds like the biggest drum machine you'd ever heard. And that was it. They were listening and they heard it. And I found out that night I got the gig over this guy that had already been hired. Wow. So that night I got a phone call. It was a Saturday night. I had one day to quit the band and moved to New York City, and I had no idea where I was going to go. And I found a room at the Hotel Vendemere on 92nd and West End. West End. And um, I moved in. I uh, just got a, just a little room, and we started rehearsals on Tuesday, and we did our first show Thursday at the Auditorium in Chicago. Wow. And that went on from October until the Christmas holidays, and then Nona Hendrix had a nervous breakdown on stage. Then a circ in a in a in a, uh, a theater in the round, <laughs> and it freaked the audience out so much that when the girls all went off stage, the crowd didn't applaud or anything. They just rushed the exits, and so the band was stuck on stage. We couldn't even get off. So anyway, <laughs> I went home, then I got a notice uh, over the holidays that Vicki Wickham, the management, she said, uh, the girls have not been able to come to terms, and I wish everybody well. You need to find other arrangements. So, you know, that's how they add in, and that was 76 into 77. So this is still pre Brian Setzer. This was 10 years before Brian Setzer. Well, I mean, and then the, the, the biggest thing was a year later, well, we, we toured with Peter Gabriel in, in late 77. Elvis had just died. And so everywhere, I mean, every airport that you went into, and especially when you, you hit Europe, everywhere you went. Troy doesn't remember when Elvis, where he was, but I remember where I was when I heard Elvis died. Mm. I was sitting in a parking lot of southwest or southeastern bell telephone with tommy delahunt and his mom worked at southeastern bell mm -hmm. remember they're all bell telephones mm -hmm. back then mm -hmm. southeastern southwestern that's whatever. right mm -hmm. and tommy had to go we had a ford pinto mm -hmm. and i was sitting in the car had the radio on and uh that's when i heard that elvis died it was a hot summer day. Yep. I remember that. Like August, wasn't it? Yeah, it was August. Um, and I heard Elvis died. What How old, what do you remember, Troy? Well, Six what, years old, man. <laughs> you no, know, what happened is so I went to Europe and I was over there. Every place you went had this big poster of the king. And it was all of them. None of them had the cool Elvis like, you know, from fifty nine sixty. They all had the fat guy with the yeah, white jumpsuit, yeah, right. you know. And the, so anyway, <laughs> right. um, we opened for Peter Gabriel on his first European tour, and uh, with who? Peter Gabriel. I mean, Nona. Were, I was with Nona Hendrix. All right. She was one of the girls in LaBelle, and right. but she was a rocker. You know, yeah, she was. I remember Nona. Yeah. So I did great, her great, great performer. Mm -hmm. So uh, she was out with the Talking head. She was the toast of New York and still is. Uh, and I still have a, you know good relations with all those people. But um, anyway, so when I was over there, uh, the Peter's management also managed Genesis and sure. and other groups as well. It was Tony Smith management. And uh, I was doing a drum solo in the set, and at one point I got a phone call. Uh, the management got a phone call. They said we'd like your drummer to come out, come down and audition 
for Brand X, which was Phil Collins. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, that I actually have. You won't know this. You won't believe this, but I have a Brand X album mm -hmm. in my house. That was Phil Collins when he was doing the jazz thing. Well, that was what I did. I went and auditioned. I, they, Steve Hall drove me down from a gig like in Manchester. And I spent that night, all day the next day, and then went back the next night and played all day with Brand X. And they said, well, you got the gig if you want it. But Phil and was... Phil was out problem. with Genesis. He was out with Genesis, so but Brand X. Was Brand X was, was going to tour whether okay. Phil was in the band or not. And when Phil wasn't doing Brand X, he always had the seat. I didn't you know, know that. but they were making me like, well, you know, you can kind of write your own ticket, you know. And I'm thinking, oh boy, and I really liked playing there, and I like London, and oh my goodness. So anyway, what happened is I had band, I had already committed to this other band with Carmine Rojas in um, Philadelphia called Baby Grand. And that turned out the guitar player wrote that song, uh, One of Us, What I've Got Was One of Us. That was Eric. And uh, and then Rob wrote Time After Time with Cindy Lauper. And so I got in with this band that were the, some of the greatest songwriters of you know the last century. And um, so Car that's where Carmine and I really went to town. Is that thing still recording? It's recording, yeah. It looks like it stopped. It's oh. going. It's going. It, the tower just stops. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, what happened is I I said, uh, well, I've already committed to this, and the manager she, management she said, you need to find out what you're going to do, Dave, because you know I'm good. I'm good. Because I was already committed. I was touring with Nona. Brand X offered me a gig, and I'd already told this other band in Philadelphia that I was going to move to Philadelphia as soon as I got done with this tour. So theoretically, I was already spoken for, but I, the band I wanted to get in, I had to tell them no, and I, I hated it. But I went and um, came back to the States and joined Baby Grand. They were doing, we were gonna do the second record for Arista, which was a new label Clive Davis had just started. And um, so I moved to Philadelphia and spent three years there from, well, no, not quite three. And then in 79, I joined Nectar which was they had this they were they were contemporaries of yes I remember and them. genesis yeah, yeah. and they're yeah. prog rock yep they had remember the future that was yeah. their big record and uh so i wound up in 79 uh we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and then we started doing tours on the east coast and then we moved the whole operation to frankfurt germany and then i lived there carmine and i were roommates for a year and that took me until 81 uh, now I was 25. I'd already been in Santana, LaBelle, Nona Hendrix, played with Brand X, opened for Peter Gabriel, played with Baby Grand, which was one of the most prestigious gigs on the East Coast, and had spent two years in Nectar, three years. And I was 25. I was only 25. And I, at that point, I was thinking, you know, back then, now people don't remember this, but that was pretty much the free world. You couldn't go to China couldn't go to the Middle East. South America had was still under communist and, you know, very sure. heavy. The wall had Pinochet, fallen. Pinochet yeah, yeah. had done all that. Yeah. And also when I was in Europe, man, you could not go into the into the uh, the Axis power states. You couldn't go to Czechoslovakia, you couldn't go to East Germany and a whole lot of other places, Poland and so on and so forth. So I, you know, we had played France, we played Luxembourg and Belgium and Holland and the United Kingdom. And the only, we didn't do any Scandinavia, but at that point, you know, the only other place you could really go was uh, uh, Japan, you know, and sure. I didn't have anything that was going to get me over there. So, you know, I was kind of thinking, well, <laughs> what do I want to do? And um, that's when I came home and my dad told me that a life insurance policy that he had paid like $20 a month from when I was a little baby, well, it finally been paid the term. And he said, well, okay, now you can either take the coverage and extend it and it'll grow, or you can take a partial payout and continued coverage, or you can take the cash value, uh, cash value of the policy. Well, how much is that? $2,000. I'll take it. I'm going to go do my demos. I'm going to do my own record. And so... I had gotten into this relationship with this real cute girl, and I had divorced my first wife. And uh, 
so anyway um and I hired David. You went to Budokan. No, I, I went. I, I got <laughs> no. David to play on all of it. I needed. I said, David, I need you to play rhythm guitar on it. I'll do all the leads, but I need you to because um, I could I could solo really well. Um, but David was just such an exquisite player, you know. So he yeah. did all the rhythm stuff. David could fit in in whatever capacity, you know. Um, and that took you know, that was the summer of eighty one, and then that took me um, into uh, eventually the, the, that kind of kept on, and and uh, things got pretty bad, you know. Uh, eventually, in nineteen eighty three, I decided I'm going to do my own band, and in nineteen late nineteen eighty two, Carmine, my partner. It was my band was Carmine, a guitar player named Doug Worthington, and me. And uh, I was going to lead, sing lead. We were going to get a drummer and a keyboardist. And the drummer was Gary Pavlika. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to take this band from New York and we're going to go down to Texas. We're going to play all over Texas for like six weeks. And my dad gave me $10,000. He said, I'd, you know, I'll give you this much. And if you need more, you, you come to me. And so we played probably 12 or 15 dates. Then uh, we finished at the uh, convention center in Temple. Um, what was the name of the band? Driving School. Okay. Driving School. And Carmine had just done the Let's Dance record with David Bowie. Right. Because all the guys from LaBelle were part of... See, Tony Thompson in, 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 uh, with, the, uh, uh, with Sheik, he was the drummer, and Niall Rogers, they were all from Queens, Bernard, they were all Queens boys. Uh, they, uh, all of this was a crew. They were all, they were cliques, and they were all crews, you know. Yeah, Niall uh, was instrumental. In that, in yeah, and most... Avery Vaughn, obviously, was on that album, but probably didn't brush shoulders with him. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean... It, Niles was not a great player at all. I mean, he was he played, dun, 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 you know, just chinka. He was. Ding, a, ding, that's ding, it. Ding, that's all ding, he did. He couldn't. Ding, 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 he could ding, not solo. But, um, but he came up with the, a lot of the riffs. He actually came up with the riffs. He wrote the songs. Yeah, he yeah. wrote him and Bernard wrote the songs. Man, they were awesome. Yeah. I mean, there was about ten years there to where they just lit the world on fire. So. Um, so anyway, Carmine. We did the tour, and then Carmine had already spent a month before we started the tour in Dallas. They were at Los Colinas rehearsing for the tour. And then... Um, they all rehearsed in Los Colinas no, for some reason. They, well, you, well they, there, there was a sound studio in Los Colinas. There were the studios at Los Colinas that were yeah. so big. I mean, you could have had a concert for 20,000 people there. I mean, it, it was seemed huge. Like, they shot movies like, there. Yeah, it seemed like all these bands... They did. Whether it was Robert Plant or whoever it was. Robert it, Plant did their Genesis. They yeah. had Shoko Sound, and then they had well, the you have to rem- Now, you Plains. have to remember something now. But most people don't know it, but Genesis was a huge juggernaut of a corporation, and Genesis was the financial, the main investor in Very Lights. You know, the yeah. lights that could yeah. change color and do all yeah, that, yeah. which was incredibly high tech for 1982 and 83 genesis financed that yeah okay so shoko and genesis were i mean shoko when we toured europe with peter gabriel the american shoko company did the tour and 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 if you went backstage i'll never forget when you go through the and we only played theaters and you'd see behind the 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 huge curtain in the back you would just hear this kind of and they're all the transformers and they were kind of glowing to to take take it from 220 240 down to 110 it was you know i'm thinking wouldn't it be cheaper just to well a lot of people don't realize that Dallas was actually one of the um, you know ground zeros for a lot of tours because absolutely because they had Shoko. The, you had Shoko and you had studios at Los Colinas and then you had Very Light you could do a whole production you could you could you could stage the entire production the pre pre tour production you could run it through its paces you could do the show and the run through and then yeah. Bowie did a lot of bands did I think the Who yeah. may have done that yeah yeah sure. So anyway, um, and so 
but once Carmine went on tour with Bowie, that was kind of we did a very famous video at Los Colinas. Gary is on it. Gary Pavlik was on it. And at that point, when I had in 1983, I had a horrible yeah, I had a horrible falling out with David. I mean, it was just awful. Uh, and I didn't talk to him again for almost 10 years. It was a very long time. It, it, people don't realize this, but we had a very combative relationship, mainly on his end. It was, I didn't have anything. I had no ax to grind with David. I always loved David and would do anything for him, but he didn't like anyone coming into his turf and taking his market value away, which we weren't going to do. I, I wasn't there to do that. Yeah. I was just trying to just play with my band and get to where we were good enough as a unit to where we could then decide what we were going to do. It was just kind of like a, a run through. Well, you wanted to talk about Brian. Brian happened in 86. And the way that happened, I had a band called Driving. I mean, uh, I had a band. This was after the Stray Cats. No, this was before this, before Brian. In nineteen, 19- well, no, Stray Cats were out in the. They, early yeah, they, they, they were huge, man. They yeah. were so big in Europe. Yeah. So, and well, they were big here. Uh, uh, Stray Cats basically came out when I was in college. So that was so when you probably played, when you played with Brian Sitzer, it was after the Stray Cats when he was doing his own yes. thing. Yeah. yeah, what had happened, the, the Stray Cats, what happened, they did that famous album, Built for Speed. Yeah. And then Brian, uh, what had happened, there was so much mismanagement that at one point they wanted to take a break. And they had these English managers. Out of the way that because of the tax laws, they have to do all these shell corporations offshore. But Brian's a, a U.S. citizen. Yes, yes. But here's just hear me out. So what happened is they went to say, okay, we want to take some money out of the account. We want to just have a vacation. We need some time off. And they said, well, there's no money. What do you mean there's no money? And you know, stop. <laughs> you know, that's it. You know, we're not doing anything until this gets straightened out. And so they just broke up. You know, huh. until until I would say eighty seven, they took about a four year hiatus, yeah. and then Brian did his solo record for Capital that um, I toured with. What happened? I, my band with Carmine, we actually put together a thing to play at the China Club, the famous China Club. We were the house band there. I mean, we were we were it, and we played January thirtieth at the China Club, and Brian was there to see my drummer alan childs but somebody told brian you don't want to you don't want alan you want that lead singer he'd play circles around alan i mean i'm uh, alan i'm sorry i love alan to death he's a great drummer but um that was the deal you know and so i got an audition that week and got the gig with uh brian setzer it was chuck lavelle on keyboards no shit and it was kenny aronson on bass and then tommy tommy burns from uh billy joel yeah he was on guitar and then brian it was four of us and good god that was the greatest band i ever played in i mean and chuck and i were real good friends you know um and he was from the south everybody else from from long island you know them d's and d's <laughs> yeah you know. billy joel's peeps yeah yeah so she, it, she just went on tour with brian what, we went on tour what kind of a guy is uh, brian sitzer <sighs> wow he's he's a long island boy right yeah he's from massapequa he's a badass yeah. guitar player oh god he's fantastic as far as did you just uh, did you just let off a little uh a no. death, it was it sounded like you crop no, dusted I didn't there. crop dust. <laughs> <laughs> Edit point. <laughs> I and go. I wouldn't do that to you. That's my chair. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. I just thought that. But if I'm gonna be accused. All right. Enough of Brian. Enough of Brian. Let's let's. What got you into music production? Because I know you have some gold and platinum records with some bands from Quite late, late eighties or early nineties and stuff. That's right. Uh, the one uh, that I know about is the band. Uh, well, Firehouse was Firehouse, a, Firehouse yeah, yeah. was a big one. That one, you know, all of them went multi platinum eventually, you know. Um, but over about a, a firehouse two, was what late was that? 91? That was 90. 
90. Firehouse, the first one was 90. The second one was 91. And Dream Theater was just before that. We finished December 11th, and Firehouse started the 16th. So what, what took you from playing the drums and playing in bands and going on tour to start doing music production? Well, Troy, it's interesting that you should say that. Uh, what happened <laughs> is I realized that the way that I knew in MTV, when I came back from Europe, MTV was the rage man i mean i came back i'll never forget it ecstasy was legal and used to have these people these distributors that would dr go from san antonio to austin waco and then dallas on thursdays and they would have thousands of these pills and you could just buy them and and it was really pretty harmless and it was the good stuff it wasn't the stuff that's like bath salts now you know i mean the stuff where you see those guys in the middle of a traffic intersection with their clothes you know <laughs> off you know barking like crocodiles um so anyway you know everybody was just just having a great time and there was mtv and everybody you go no matter where you went everybody lived in apartments back then and you'd see you'd see people there watching tv with the sound off listening to their favorite records you know hitting bongs and stuff like that and and mtv had no commercials back then and it was just videos and it was mainly like live videos it was great you got to see all your your you know favorite artists but the thing that i knew is that uh oh this is the worst thing for us because at that point it meant that there was no more mystery you know, you were going to be inundated 24 hours a day, whether you wanted to or not. It was all the mystery was gone. And so the, the, the rate of exchange just accelerated in terms of, you know, people would come up and then they'd be gone within a year. Come up and, be, and, and I just knew that it was going to be the death now. And then there was so much people were more interested in sitting it was around. One hit wonder time. A lot, a lot of that. Yeah. And then there was you know, eight three seven five three zero oh, nine. You know that kind of no, stuff. No, it's eight six, six. I don't know what it is. That you number's know. in Waco. You can call that number in Waco. Get somebody. <laughs> I've called them. Dominoes. <laughs> so hey, let me get one of those. Yeah. So anyway, what happened is I, I just, I had, there's a couple things that, that honestly happened. Number one, my hearing started to become an issue because I, um, in 1982, I developed a, pr a pretty wicked case of tinnitus. And uh, thank you, sir. So what happened is that um, my ears will ring until the day I die. They're ringing as loud as we're talking right now. Get tinnitus? Oh, tinnitus, yeah, whatever you, whatever whatever. you want to call I do it. Too. Ringing my ears. ring all the time, too. Oh, no, mine are wicked. So anyway, I, and, and, and it's all from uh, excessive exposure, overexposure to noise. Well, if I hit one snare drum and I hit a rim shot like I do, it cracks, sounds like a, you know, sounds like an M80 going off. Um, what, I mean, you know, so now I have to wear plugs. Well, it's like having sex with a condom and it's thick. It's like, what's the point? Yeah. You know, it's like calisthenics. And so even with Brian Setzer, I wore these. I, my ear had so much glycerin inserted and then another plug on top of that just so. And, and then I'd have the monitors loud enough to where I could hear it over then. Did Brian play loud? No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that. that Brian wasn't playing that loud. Uh, as a matter of fact, we started out playing loud and it just got ridiculous and then uh, Don Gaiman, the producer, came in and, and did a great thing. He said, I want you guys to just, we were trying to do a sound check in Albany and every we had the side fill monitors and the floor monitors so loud that I mean everything just rang and was noisy as hell. And he said, I want you guys to stop. We're going to turn all the monitors off. And I want you guys to set your amps up in such a way as that you can hear each other on stage. So just play through the amps. Yeah, and get your volume. You know, find out a spot where you can stand and hear your amp, yeah. because you're not going to make it this way. I mean, this is yeah. this is just not going to work. Yeah. And once we did that, he would just put a little bit of my kick and snare in his monitor so he can you know hear that. And then I'd have a lot of Brian. I mean, Brian wouldn't let me count the songs off. He counted every song. He just, 
you know, and I said, fine, you know, you're paying, I mean, you know, he's paying me like $1,500 a week and I'd make about another five or $600 in per diems and I'd eat free food every day. So, you know, as long as you're paying, I will do whatever <laughs> you, I'll play with brushes back there if you want yeah, to. Yeah, right. And um, he hated my gut. Absolutely hated me. Just could not stand me. And it's hard to like a guy when they hate you. <laughs> but uh, but I really, you know, I thought the world of Brian. And uh, he's a great guitarist. You know, I mean, he's always been considered very temperamental, you know, and, and he is. You know, I mean, they're. So the thing is, um, you just kind of, you know, he's he is a star, and he's always been. I remember Brian from when he was 17 years old. He had a band called the Bloodless Pharaohs, and I used to see him down South Street in Philadelphia, and he was so pretty. He looked like Mia Farrah. I mean, he was he had this androgynous, angelic face, and he had this blonde hair, and he was always. You know, he he was just too cool for school. And that big old Gretsch, he just rocked it. Well, ba back then, I think he may have played like a, a Strat or something. He wasn't playing the big right. Gretsch. He didn't do the Gretsch thing until they did the Stray Cats, and then that was the whole thing. With, yeah. I mean, Brad, uh, Brad, I mean, Brian was so heavily tattooed. I used to joke with him. I'd say, Brian, come here. You know, there's a spot there in your elbow. You <laughs> yeah, put, you got a, you yeah, got a you room. little room. <laughs> yeah, you he got said, room. yeah, I was thinking about that, you know. Sometimes he was very approachable and, and cheery, and then other times it was, oh, you know. I, I mean, it got it got so bad that you had, um, what was the name of that airlines back then? They had that airline. Spirit? No, no. it was before. The one that. The, the one that was like the, uh, it was like dollar a flight at yeah, one right. point. I can't remember the name of them. Anyway, it, 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 when we were going from Chicago to Arizona, I just take, took these little shuttles. I just go and find out the hotel we were booked in. I'd go there a day early. You know, I just couldn't deal with it. You know, a seventeen-hour bus ride with people that couldn't stand you. No thanks. <laughs> you know. So anyway, and that made him mad. <laughs> so even when I get out of your your hair, you know that oh, it was it was difficult. Let's go back to music production. You started. So what happened is that I in 1982 I brought Carmine. I was living. Oh God! Oh, I didn't tell you I was in Sam and Dave too. Uh, we played. I get my my roommate. I mean, you want to hear with Sam and Dave? Yeah, you want to hear the craziest story? At one time in 1982, I was looking for a place to stay. I was in New Jersey, just relocated to New Jersey from Texas after coming back from Nectar, and um, so I moved back. And uh, I was looking for a place to stay, and I answered a, a, an ad for a roommate wanted in Warren, New Jersey, and I call up, and it's Halloween night. And I say, hi, my name's David Prater. I'm answering an ad in the accordion for a roommate wanted. Yeah, Dave, what do you, uh, what's going on? Uh, yeah, yeah, where are you? Excuse me, I'm, I'm calling about a room. Yeah, Dave, it's George. Dave and Sam and Dave, the black guy, his name was David Prater. He thought I was Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and he is, and he died. And he died, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And so what happened, and he, he said, no, are you serious? And I said, I, uh, yes, I am, sir. You know, I didn't know him. And so I went and met him, and he said, yeah, you can stay here. So now I'm David Prater, and he's the musical director for Sam and Dave. So about a year later, he says, this is in 82, he tells me, Hey, listen, the drummer that we have is really a flake. And uh, could, would you uh, mind doing some gigs with us? And I said, hell no, man. It sounds like fun. And so I, I brought Carmine in, and we did these dates. Uh, well, actually, the only uh, I did these dates, and it was the, the bass player was Tim Tyndall, Carmine's ex Brody. This was in '82. We did like four or five dates. And then I got a nod from George. He says, listen. Do you have a passport? And I said, hell yeah. And he said, well, we're going to go to Japan and play Yokohama Stadium in the Osaka Speedboat Arena. And we're going to be, it was going to be us, Chuck Berry, and RC Succession, this big band in, in Japan. So I brought Carmine as the piano player. And I was Dave Prater. 
So technically, he could say it's Sam and it's Sam Moore and the Sam and Dave Review, because I was Dave Prater, and uh, Joyce McRae, Sam's manager, had a daughter, and Sam she brought- Moore and Dave Prater, you. <laughs> You're awesome. I, I, I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. Now, I do have a couple of pictures of that. I got the brochure of it. It was the craziest yeah. thing. And then a typhoon hit. And uh, so, anyway, we, we did those two shows. And uh, and, then and after, those Japanese were ripped off, weren't they? Mm -mm, mm. No, they loved us. And Is so, it? yeah. But and you're so, not black. Well, most of the bands I played in, I was black. I mean, I was, I was, I'm sorry, most of the bands I played in were black bands, and I, I was a white guy. You didn't, you didn't blackface it. No. no. Yeah. Oh, mammy, there's no show business. So anyway, um, but the reason I'm telling you this is while we were there, the word on the street is, there's these things called a Tascam 240, 244. It's a four-track cassette deck. Sure. You're kidding, that's great. And you couldn't get them in the United States. You could get the 144, but it had Dolby C, and it wasn't very good. The one you wanted was the 244, and it was still a year or two away. Well, I went to Japan. You could get it gray market, and if you didn't declare it, you could bring it through customs. Sure. So we went to Akihabara, which was the big electronics district there. And um, what happened is, is we went there, and I got the four track, and that's how I started recording. And when I came back... I decided I wasn't going to tour anymore in uh, like 85 and then when, with Brian that's when uh, we did a video for MTV the concert series and um, the girl that produced it was dating uh, one of the big head executives with Akai and Akai had this thing called a 1214 it was a big desk and it had a digital um, uh, busing matrix and all of this but it was a it was a tape machine you know but it had digital kind of interface so I got that and boy I, I started doing some really good work and that's when word got out that because I'd always loved to record I could just stay inside and I loved nothing better than just staying up all night so that was your entree into the uh Producing. Yeah, and also I was working on the docks at Roadway in West Patterson at that uh, big depot there. So was Firehouse the first big band that you had? No, no. The first thing I did was on Epic in 1989, a band called Diving for Pearls. And that made a lot of noise and came that far from breaking. Um, was and it hair, kind of hair metal kind of music or what was it? No, this was really very very sophisticated i mean that's why you know they're really very fond of that first record we only did one record in uh, prague you just have to hear it uh, yeah i'll take it yeah, uh, as, I'm, as a kind of a lot of backwash there <laughs> so anyway um i did that in nashville digital it was a you got no yeah or, or, or am i out no you just uh Clinking that can a little bit. Oh, I'll put it in the koozie if you get me another one. Yeah, I'll get you another one. So anyway, what happened is I got the... Um, I, I finagled my way into a meeting with Epic Records, a guy named Michael Kaplan, and I, I, I wound up going through an exhaustive uh, proving process with demos and stuff. And when you worked with the record companies back then, you had to do these very elaborate demos because they didn't want to they would sign a band and then they'd have to do these demos so you get a demo deal and those are usually about ten thousand dollars and you might make a couple of grand three four five thousand dollars and work for a couple of weeks and it was it was decent money you know you had net maybe that's good money yeah back then you know i mean uh, yeah. rents weren't much and yeah and so anyway what happened is that word started getting out there is this guy that's a really good musician and he's just a hell raiser and musicians really like working with him and he doesn't take any shit you know um i, I was really good at uh making sure that everybody got on got on point you know stayed on task because when you get in there oh man if you you know you do <laughs> You do not want a mutiny in the middle of a project. Somebody decided, no, I, I, I can do this now. You know, out of here. Uh-uh. That ain't going to work. 
and so you have to you, you have to do that in such a way that that you have, you have to win their trust, obviously, and their respect. But um, but you got to deal with the drugs, and you got to deal with well. Mainly, you just have to deal with de- insecurities. You know, people are terrified. Yeah. This is my this is my big shot. I've worked all my life, and the chances are you're not going to make it. Uh, but man, I started. I swung for the fences every time I went in. My first record was at eighty seven. Eighty seven. It was with Glenn Burtnick on Heroes and Zeros for A and M, and that one caused a big ruckus. So the word was getting out. Every record that I was doing every year. And where were where, where where were you located when you were doing these Jersey? Records? I was in Montclair, New Jersey. Okay. You had a whole recording studio set up. No, it's not much more elaborate than here. <laughs> You know, I mean, I would just kind of hang a shingle on the door and say, want to record, you know, and uh, just be me with, you know, some shitty little speakers and some headphones, you know, and, but I'd get it done. That's how I did all the dirty dancing pre-production for all, for the movie. I did all of that. Really? Mm-hmm. Did uh, Hungry Eyes, and um, I wrote some of that. I didn't get credit for it, unfortunately. And then uh, Time of My Life won the Academy Award in 87, and I'd done all of that. I was just crushed when I didn't get a thanks or anything for it. And so it, things were, things all of a sudden, the, the ice was starting to break, you know, and then, and then we, it was, I could see open water, you know, and it was just, if I could just, you know, make it until the spring thaw, you know, I'll be okay. And then at one point, I came into Michael Kaplan's office, and I was just, frustrated you know we'd done a record in 89 and i was just taking really crappy gigs that i didn't want to do and um then i uh i got a um he said i said mike what, what, man we could do so much more than this i mean god when is, what's it going to take for us to do another record and he and he started giggling he said okay go shut the door and i went huh and he said, "All right, this band I got. It's called it's called White Heat. Um, I don't, I, but they they have to change their name. But that's not important. And they're they're out of the Car- North Carolina Charlotte area." And I said, "Okay." And he put me on a speaker call with uh, Bill Leverty and CJ, the the main guys in Firehouse. And so we hit it off real good. And this is like a Monday or a Tuesday, and by Friday. I was down in the Raleigh, Charlotte area, uh, seeing one of their live gigs, and the next week they were in my house, and they camped out for about two weeks. We did all the pre-production, and then we went in and did the record, and then that thing just exploded. That was, those right, guys, at, that was right at the that end was, of the hair band. We were the like, last yeah. people to get in before the door came. Before Slam Nirvana, shut. Before yeah. Nirvana yeah. Yeah. busted. Well, they won the best new, I guess it was metal, uh, best new metal act in 1990 on the American Music Awards, back when that was a big thing. And guess who they won it over? Nirvana, Alice in Chains, and Pearl Jam. <laughs> really? Yeah, and then Firehouse won, and oh, people weren't happy was about it. Was it 90 that. or 91? That was 90. Yeah. Actually, that was ninety one. Yeah. That was ninety one. Yeah. yeah, that was that was ninety one, and um, and then then CJ got up there, and I was mixing the record, watching the, the awards, and getting the awards on TV, and he gets to the very end. And he says, "Well, that's about it. Anything else?" And they, you didn't thank me again. Oh <laughs> no, I was crushed. Always a bridesmaid. Uh, yeah, I mean that's you know kind of been. The so how long did it take to record that that album? Any uh, any uh... every every album I ever made uh, I made you know either under or directly on budget ahead of schedule. I mean, I was your man. And I how mean, does that guy sing that high? Is what I want to know. Very well. I mean, CJ was the most professional guy I've ever worked with. He had a tape. He had a little like a um, Panasonic handheld like dicta recorder kind of a thing, just a little speaker, and he had his no, you know, he'd have these vocal, you know, any vocally. recording tricks that you used to do back then that you wouldn't do now or different than you would do now. Well, back then there used to be a big thing is that you know, okay, all right, uh, you, I I I I had a, a method that was foolproof. It was 
you you couldn't lose if you if you just shut up and did what I told you to do. So you had a procedure of how you did your. your I had a work. I had a very established. You had a workflow. Workflow, and it was very similar to a lot of other guys, but I took it quite a bit further. I would uh, the first thing I do is I'd get the arrangement to where it sounded like it was going to be interesting. I didn't want to just do okay verse or you know intro. And then you'd play a little bit either over the chorus with no vocals or whatnot. Then you go into the verse. And then you go into the B verse and you go to the chorus. You go back to the verse, maybe a little four bar, little guitar thing. But it's basically first chorus, first chorus, bridge, chorus out. You know, yeah. almost every song was like that. Yeah. They used to call the verse A and the B verse B and then the chorus C. So go A, B, C, A, B, C, D, A. I mean, a, a C. You know, yeah. that, was, that was how they used to do it. And that's why they called it Abacab, A B A C A B. You know, there was like the Genesis album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a that was a that was an acronym for right. um, the the method that we and that's how everybody works. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't work that way, you work that way, and you just don't know it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, but um, if you're doing if you're doing anything with pop, you know. Um, so, you know, that may sound kind of stiff and regimented. It's really not. You know, it's, it, there's a whole lot of variation within that structure. But anyway, but what I got, what, what was popular then is I'd always, I'd always lay down, all right, here's the tempo, okay, uh, 105. Okay, so I'd say that's what it is. And either we had lay down a drum machine playing some little pattern over and over so you could play your parts. So you would play, the, the, you'd do two rhythm guitars, and you'd pan them left and right. Along with the drum track you laid down. Yeah. Okay. And then you'd have the bass player come in, and then he would play accordingly. And then you would have the singer, who had always been kind of singing along, telling you, yeah, all right, now, two, three, four, now. You know, so, you, so the singer knew that everything was going to work with the arrangement. So you had both guitars left and right, sounded big, bass in the middle, vocal, singing basically the song just you know but scratch just track. scratch track but i always re-recorded it really well you know i use the same mic the, sometimes we wound up using that vocal and um so anyway uh and then when you put the drums on the drummer all when the drummer would play so the drummer would play last yes but then once the drummer played then you go back in and you replace the instruments you didn't keep the instruments because the instruments you weren't going for the greatest performance just good enough you were to just getting the, it down you're just getting it good enough to where the drummer knew where the changes were going to go I got you. you know he could do the blah, boop, 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 you know do all those kind of things and so well, I would, and I didn't spend a lot of time laying the stuff down, you know. And, and if a guy didn't know his parts, I'd scream at him like, "It's not that hard." If you don't believe me, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And if a guy started talking about his basing, I say, "Look, any, it's are good. there any tracks on that album or any other album that you said, you know what, I can do this better?" When he was a third, I went and played. Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did a lot of that. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, you I did pulled a, the Paul McCartney on him. Is what you did. Well, uh, but not, I mean... Because, you know, they, Paul... they know? Paul well, went in there and, uh, and everyone else was well, Paul... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he went in and you did mean, Ringo's... Uh, yeah, did, did you ever hear that John Lennon quote? Yeah. It was like, you think Ringo's the greatest drummer in the world? Uh, Ringo's not even the greatest drummer in the band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, but Paul played a lot of that doom, yeah. doom, yeah. doom. What do you do? When you, you know all those exactly. lollygagging. Yeah, yeah. That was Paul. That was Man, Paul. he played. Really? Yeah. Oh, there's famous pictures of Ringo playing hi hat, snare, and kick, and Paul leaning over with headphones <laughs> yeah. playing the fills. Yeah. yeah, there's. Yeah, I mean, you can go read any of those, yeah, and you'll yeah. find out they yeah. did whatever they so had fi- to do. Firehouse sold how many albums? Two, two oh, million? two, three. You know, and then on different countries, you sell ten thousand and it's platinum. So you know, internationally, you know, if you have a multi, if you have a platinum record, you're multi platinum. So after Firehouse, that led to. Uh... Then I did a, a, a thing with Natasha Kinski, the famous actress. I did a project I for her, and uh, that was wild. And but after that, I was doing a lot of live gigs with Glenn Burtnick. We were just doing regional tours, 
And um, then I, I, there was a guy named Derek Oliver at Atlantic that kept saying, Dave, you know that record's gonna, it's really going to be huge. I mean, it's fantastic. If are you aware of that? And I, you know, I never paid any attention to you know if it. I just I, I didn't ever fixate on my chart position or anything like that. And then I found out one day I look, I said, God, man, we're number five. You know, this was on the big what, charts. What is this? The Firehouse? Firehouse, yeah. Love of a Lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Because people, if I showed you this, I've got it at home. I should have brought it. But there is this, the way it used to be, you had, you would, you'd you get billboard on a Tuesday morning and it would give you your chart position. I mean, that was, oh, you lived and died on Tuesdays. And um, so you would go, you would always, you knew where the music, you knew where the, the, the newsstand was that you could just run out before you got coffee and get the billboard board and, and have your coffee and just rifle through that thing and find out every station that had played you and all that kind of stuff so the, the, if when you got you used to go through you know little announcements like uh, the executive uh, you know clearing house who's with who now and who left here to go here and then then it would go to the top 200 and the top 200 was the top 100 singles on page one and two and then you flip over two and there would be page three and four the bottom 200 and so I was in the top 10 of the top 100. It wasn't like college most active or heavy rock heat seeker. <laughs> it wasn't any of that garbage. Guys say, I have a number one record, but what is it in? Oh, it's in Hot Tracks Rock. Yeah, but you're not even on the top 200. So how are you telling me it's number one? Well, you know, so you it was just stupid, you know. I mean, but they it was kind of like when when you have a kid that goes and and it's, he's in a tournament and his team finishes last but they still give him a trophy. It was that kind of garbage. But back Are then Are they coming second but there's only two teams? <laughs> <laughs> and you share first place or something. Oh Lord. So anyway, um but you know, people, you can't imagine. I mean, what it's like to see Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, and then you, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, I mean, most of the top forty was black. You know, uh, there wasn't a lot of rock. There was no rock. Yeah. You yeah. know, and you had to do a ballad to get in. But I actually got in with uh, "Don't Treat Me Bad." That was the first single with Firehouse. They, Baby, yeah. Don't treat me bad. You treat me bad. <laughs> nice. You don't. You don't remember. Yeah, that, yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. Wait, when I used to jam that back in the day, man. Yeah. Um. So. The thing was that um, when Epic this Epic had this thing, everybody they were saying we want to go back to the days when Boston like more than a feeling, you know that kind of stuff, and. Um, so they wanted to go back to that, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, kind of uplifting, harmless kind of, you know, rock. Big chorus. You, rock. Oh, yeah. huge choruses. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I said, done. You know, I can do that. You know, that's easy. Um, and so uh, we did Don't Treat Me Bad. And that just, that opened the door real quick. And then I started hearing the scuttlebutt in the street, like, man, you've got a huge record. Do you know that? No. I was just trying to work. And then when I was doing the, the first Dream Theater, uh, Images and Words, that's when Derek said, you know, you've got a huge record. And I said, really? And then at one point when we got into the top five, you know, it all hell broke loose. I mean, it was incredible. It was the most, it was the greatest time of my life. I mean, it was just, I was 34, 35 years old. And just firing on all cylinders. I mean, I was in the top of my game. So, so Firehouse is top five, and but you're working on the the, the Dream Theater album. Oh, we had one, two, three. We had f three or four singles from Firehouse. I used to have a couple of singles in the same time in the top 100. Yeah. And then Dream Theater came out, and I'll never forget James Labrie asking me and his Canadian. Hey Dave, what do you think about uh, you a know boat. a boat? Yeah. You can always tell a Canuck, you know. He sounds like he's from the East Coast, and he goes, "A boat? Oh, you're from Canada, huh?" As soon as they say a, a boot, boat, then yeah. you know. <laughs> or a, you know. Oh, what do you think about one of our songs getting out there, eh? Hey, Orzer. So talk about the process of Dream Theater because those they're they're a little more uh, 
technical Dream, band. Dream Theater and... was easy for me to do because I grew up on fusion. Mm-hmm. I was in, you know, Nectar for God's sakes, and I'd played in Santana and was, and was it the same process? Did you lay down the drum machine and bring the guitars in, or did yep. you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I did. Well, now Mike would go in. Um, Mike played from memory. He played. Yeah, I'll take one. <laughs> I'll, uh, you know, it's the only time I ever smoke is when we do something like this. You know, <laughs> at my age, you know, you're not supposed to. It's it's considered bad form, but hey, you know, you only live twice. You can die anyway. So anyway. Um, I mean, Dream Theater, man. My feet never touched the the, the ground that whole time. It was just I. I, I remember I, when that 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 they started playing that song, "Pull Me, Pull Under, me Under. On MTV. Well, that was the last song that we. That was the last song written that we did. Um, I, that I did in pre-production. I didn't do. I did a couple of songs um, it, it, where I had to do pre-production for the label. I did. I did three songs: "Forever," "Take the Time," and. Metropolis, and Metropolis and Take the Time are on the first album. How many albums did you do with Dream Theater? Two. I did Change of Seasons, which was an EP, but it had that one song, Change of Seasons. It was 22 minutes and five seconds long. So you that's like doing half a record. <laughs> you produced both of those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did a, uh, Images and Words. The, the Images and Words is by far the top selling record that they ever did. I mean, that really, yeah. that really created. Like, Pull Me Under was on MTV all the time back then. I never saw it. I never. I remember seeing it on Headbangers Ball and, you know. Yeah, I'll never forget Kevin asking me one day, hey, what do you think we should have as our singly? And you know, I said, Kevin, well, you guys are never going to get played on the radio. That's the stupidest question I've ever next. And he was like, oh, man, I was hoping, no, you guys just go out and have a good time. Enjoy it. You know, you're just going to be a cult band, you know. Yeah. Boom. They And we edited this thing down to like four and a half minutes, yeah. and they it? wouldn't play it, you know, because it, it was people wanted the long version, like yeah. seven minutes or whatnot. Sure. And so anyway, um, uh, you know, Firehouse was one thing, but, you know, if I hadn't have done Dream Theater, I'd have never really had much of a career. You know, because Dream Theater was like, you know, you go in, okay, uh, I'm going to start a corporation. I'm, my dad gave me some money. I'm going to buy out this business or whatever you're going to do. And you want to talk to a lawyer and you go in and it says, uh, you know, Harvard or UT Law or whatever. He's going to have that behind him. It's his degree that lets you know, like, hey, you're in good hands. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. For me, it's, Images and words, you know, that's my law certificate. You know, I'm open for business. Don't fuck with me. I did that record, you know, yeah. okay? All right, you're, you know, hail to the chief. Um, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but I'm, but, but that really kind of cemented what I had always wanted people to feel about me, that I was qualified, you know, that I knew what I was doing and I wasn't gonna drop the ball. And I wish I could have just kept going with Dream Theater, but it was just impossible with Mike. I mean, he was, he, you know, it was just impossible. Impossible you know? how? Well, I mean, he uh, just, he disapproved of me on every level. You know, he didn't believe I knew, knew anything about drums, which is, was as, as offensive as you can possibly imagine. Um, you know, I, I mean, what, what what am I supposed to do? Well, give me your sticks, I'll show you. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, he, he didn't show me any respect. And um, okay, fine. You know, I, geez, I mean, I've I've been, you know, I'm a big boy. I've I've been through that before. But it, you know, it it was it it got taken to the extreme though. And I got along great with everyone except really Mike and Kevin, the keyboardist. And they were kind of thick as thieves. Just if, you know, if they could have. You know, they didn't want to work with me. They wanted somebody else, but they didn't know who it was. But they had already done their first album with Terry Date. And Terry was firing on all cylinders. He'd done uh, Soundgarden and, God, Incubus and a lot. I mean, he was Mr. Seattle. He was Mr. Grunge, you know. I mean, if you wanted to, you know, and Terry was really good. But he did one record for him on Mechanic. It was a small label. And it was a weird sounding record. It was weird. It sounded out of phase. It hmm. it, it really did. It was just it was real swirly and 
something was wrong and i know what it is is that when it came time to mix he didn't he didn't keep the band out of the control room so everybody was saying hey i, I can't hear any reverb on my snare and that or i don't know what but i could yeah. tell that there was turn too up many, the bass right there was something yeah. you know and that is the kiss of death and at that time i had a standing rule that when i mixed you were not allowed in the control room were and, they happy with the mix of uh, of that album you did for them um i never it, I, I left, I, there was so much animosity between Mike and Kevin and me that um, I, it got to the point to where I just wasn't going to argue anymore. I was just going to do it because I was, I was not going to drop the ball with the record company. And, um, you know, I mean, w w w what am I supposed to do? Do it your way? Go back and start over? You know? So anyway, what happened is it came time we finished the record finished the mixes and then i booked a f i had like four days off and i booked a uh, flight to miami and i was going to stay in this real nice hotel for three days and swim and eat you know and rest and just sleep you know because i had not slept <laughs> and um and, and then the, the day i got back i was going to start firehouse and so um they had a listening party the night that i left and apparently when I wasn't there, they didn't like that, you know. But I thought that they would be more comfortable with me not there because they had, huh. you know, because, uh, I mean, I was cool with Kevin and John Myong. So you were doing a new, an, uh, another firehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But by that time, grunge had taken over. and The writing was on the wall, and yeah. I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. By the time I did uh, uh, Steve Piercy, uh, his band. Uh, what what it, album it, did you do with him? It was Arcade. It okay. was the first one. It was a great record, but I got let go right what, towards the end. What was, year was that? That was '93. So he had left Rat. Yeah. And was doing his own thing. Mm. But he was doing it with a guy named Fred Corey, who had been the drummer in Cinderella, and we yeah. got in a bad fist fight one time. Because he dumped a bunch of food, some sushi in my lap. He was yelling and screaming, and I just said, I had enough of this poodle. <laughs> All right. So I wrote him a ticket, you know, and uh, so that was the end of my relationship with, uh, you know, Epic at that point. But I'd really kind of, at that, I was already burnt, you know, because it was, because that kind of music, there was no place for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, cause uh, and I just knew it. You know, uh, I recorded I recorded Arcade the same time Motley Crue was doing the Black Record with John uh, Krasaba. Yeah, yeah, that's a good record. That's a great oh, record. Man. That's probably the best Motley Crue album. No question. I saw them. I saw them. No that, question. I about saw them that. at Fort Hood on that album. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. I think even Mick Mars says that that's probably the, the oh best, it is it's a model. great record and randy staub mixed it and he's my favorite one of my favorite mixers out there he is incredible he's canadian he mixes really raw and the drums ring for days and the snare is like gunk you know it's real real live and rambunctious but that was a, that was a, they were rec recording across the street and um it was just a uh, Los Angeles was a turbulent place to try and work at that point. It was right after the riots, which didn't help. John, what, what was his name? I thought it was Cor Cor John Karabi. Karabi, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was great. He's a great guitar player. That was a too. badass album, man. Oh, that was a that was a rocking was album. Rocking album, album. And that um, guy could sing way better than Vince Neil could ever sing. Oh, he yeah, he was a real singer. You know, and he went on the tour with Vince Neil. When Vince couldn't sing, John would sing. There were nights Vince really? couldn't. Oh, Vince was a mess. What was that one gig they did? It was it Billy Bob or someplace, and Vince knocked out the monitor mixer, attacked him physically, assaulted him. You know, every time he turned around, he's getting charged with first degree assault or some bullshit. I mean, <laughs> God. And I have a little, like, dust up, and all of a sudden I am considered the Mar Marquis de Sade, the <laughs> devil incarnate. So after after uh, Dream Theater and uh, Firehouse, wh where did you go from there? I did Arcade. Okay. And then um, I did uh, Night Ranger, 
after arcade. That's when David was on. David's on. I that was where David and I, I. I called him up and I said, "Is there? Would you be opposed, David? How about if we just bury the hatchet and not talk about any of your misgivings with me?" Were you in Salado at this time? No, no, I was living in Austin. Okay, I had uh, moved there. My dad had had a heart attack in '92, and I'd been in Europe. And, um, and no, it was 93 he had had a heart attack. No? No, 92. 92 he had had a heart attack. So, 94, I moved to Austin. And was living just off Jaeger Lane there on 35. And so, anyway, um, I got the call from the former A&R head at Epic, Don Grierson. He said, uh, I mean, he was an Australian. Uh, Dave, it would be great if you'd do this, you know, record for this little band called Night Ranger. And I said, I'd love Night Ranger. I'd love to do it. And I knew all the guys from California because they were from the peninsula. They were down near Redwood City and, and uh, San Mateo, I think. This is one Brad Gillis. Yeah, they had had a band called Rubicon yeah. that closed, I think, the, the first California jam. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway... Um, they they were not in good uh they weren't in a good place because jack was out doing the damn Yan uh, yankees thing yeah. and doing the ringo star thing and yeah. and it was it was you know but but they were great uh the bass player was unbelievable gary moon i mean he sang like Gil glenn hughes i mean he was when he opened up his mouth it was like that old uh, you ever see that cartoon character Vavoom this little thing he wore glasses and he'd walk around and anytime like somebody some evil person was trying to do something to the world Vavoom would come up and he would open his mouth and it would blow these guys you know off <laughs> if you didn't see it it's impossible to see. I guess it's, it's probably anime or whatever they call it now but when he opened his mouth it was just terrifying oh he had this you know, he, he had this way of using his falsetto to, you know, kind of like Brian Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, so when he'd start opening up and singing in the upper octave above C4, wow, you know, it was it was amazing. And then you had Kelly, and he's one of the greatest singers I've ever heard. He's just, when he, he, he can just, when you, if he gets a song in his key where it suits his register, he's as good as it gets. And it was just uh, three of them. It was Brad, Kelly, I mean, uh, Gary on, on bass, and uh, Kelly. And Brad would do the guitar parts. He would have a harmonizer, and he'd click the harmonizer, and it would be like Jeff Watson. And right. then uh, Gary, he would play acoustic guitar some, and then he would play bass, you know, during the rock and stuff. Because Jeff was gone at that point. Jeff was gone. Jeff, I think Jeff had been, you know, he had, he had had enough of the drugs and needed to get clean and... And he really got himself together, and um, and I think he later came back a couple of years after David left, and Jeff started doing some shows with him. But I don't know what they're doing now. So, 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 Night Ranger was working on an album, and you were he wor no. What was what the problem was is Brad Gellis just hated my guts, and he. Um, I don't know why I, uh, because I it was. Seems like everybody hates your guts, except the guy, except for the guys <laughs> that are really, you know, the, the ones you want, <laughs> the singer, you know. <laughs> the, so this was after Brad had already played with Ozzy, and yeah. they basically reformed the band, and Jeff Watson was gone. Jeff was gone, and uh, it was David Zajac came in. Well, what happened? Now, what happened is we were trying to do the record and they didn't have any songs and i went out to california and i spent about two three weeks out there and got nothing done what gave them the idea to do a new night ranger record because don Greer's? without don without Greer's? because that kind of music was sort of old school at the time but i mean it, it wasn't the but style. did you hear did you ever hear feeding off the mojo you should hear that record it's a good record there's not a damn thing wrong with that record and it really it didn't fit um the time I mean, period well, I mean, it, it it kind of stood on its own. I mean, it didn't, I can't really, you know, I mean, it went, it was very rich and layered and textured. It was a good record. But, um... But Jack Blades wasn't on it. Jack wasn't on it, you and, know. And, uh, Watson, 
Jeff wasn't on it. Uh, Jeff wasn't on and it. It was basically Brad Gillis and, and it, Zajac was on the Well, side. no, Brad, Brad had nothing to do with it. it uh, the way I had to do it is I called David up and I said, would you help me arrange this record? And I'll go get a, an eight-track cassette player and i rented one from rock and roll rentals and was, they used to make it i think was it called a 388 or something like that and it was an eight track cassette i mean imagine that and um i did all the songs i did the drums and printed it down to stereo and then have a bass that's three guitar left and right that's four and five and three tracks open for lead vocals and whatever else and so we could make a good sketch and i sketched out the whole record and then brought Kelly and Gary. What and songs? You, you see, the songs on the record that wound up. I know, on, I know, but where, where did, you said they didn't have any songs, though. But well, they had sketches, but they had ideas. The way songs. that I carves things up, I mean, I, you know, I I don't sit around and, and do that by committee. I just don't do it. If, you know, if 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 you don't have it together before I get there, you're gonna get it together for them. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I you just have to do that. You know. And Steve Piercy was fine with that. I uh, worked the same way. Steve and I got along great. I mean, I like Steve, and everybody thought that, oh, that was the problem. No, Fred Corey was the problem. Steve was fine. Uh, so, anyway. Um, yeah, Bo said that Steven's, Steven was like, Why do I, I don't need to worry about the melody because Bo's going to tell me what to sing anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what Steve. Oh, when yeah. I did the Steve, Bo Hill, yeah. when I did Bo Hill did the first four or five Rat albums. Yeah, that's when Bo was just firing on all cylinders from about '82 until probably the late '80s. He he pretty much had run its course, but he he earned an enormous amount of money because of all the songwriting he did. Yeah, because he wrote all of the songs, either a co-write or by himself. You know, so that was where you clean up. Yeah. You can, you know, I was making, I don't know, between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars to do a record, and I would get three points. And then if it so, went platinum, so I'd get. Do you still additional. get like if somebody buys, like if I download a Firehouse or Not Dream anymore. Theater? It theater got record. so screwed up. I just took a took. I shouldn't have done it, but I took a buyout, and I just said the hell with it. I mean, I was just really. Um, very th those were my th those were the year those were the wilderness years shall yeah, we say yeah, yeah. and i had some wild experiences that everybody knows about um so from after the night ranger record and then i went in to do the second dream theater in 95 and the night ranger didn't do anything but it was still a good record you know yeah. it was important so, so but let's go back to Night Ranger real quick. So, so David helped you record. David, we we completely rejuvenated and reignited our relationship, and we were as thick as thieves again, and really remained that way until the day he died. And I paid him. You know, I always paid David, um, and paid him well. I mean, it, it was worth his his time, and. Um, I always tried to pay everybody if I could because you if you you know if you don't then, you know. I mean, it, you just it, it's an insult to people and I think I think I think it's a sign of respect you know even if it's fifty dollars give them something um but with David um God he did a great job and we did all and Kelly came down and he said oh this is great I love it and Gary's like yeah man I can do this and I can do that and Brad said I hate it <laughs> we started the record over four or five five times we started in california that didn't work then we went to bear tracks in upstate new york that didn't work then we went to paternalis at willie's studio and brad said nope i'm not gonna do it and then we went and did rehearsals at austin rehearsal complex a a a arc and then he uh, he said one more time nope i'm not gonna do it and so finally i just blew up and I just called the record company, and we had a conference call, and I just... <laughs> what you record, should have heard what some record of this label, shit. What, what record label was they Drive. On? Drive Entertainment. Yeah. And uh, it was Don Grierson. He had a label with a couple of other guys. And... Um, but I just had it, you know. And the thing that Brad thought is he thought that I was going to do a pop record, and he didn't realize how good a guitar player I had been in, in, in my day, and that I had arranged the whole album to where it was going to feature Brad. 
and I couldn't get him to just try it. Brad, would you just try it? So finally, it came down and uh, to one night at the townhouse I rented for him in Austin um, off of Mopac and 183. And Kelly and Gary said, oh, man, you guys, you know, I don't know how are you going to do it? I don't want to be here. So we left. They went and they went to a bar, and Kelly doesn't drink. You know, he's a... Yeah, he's been on the wagon forever and so you know they were scared shitless this is this is this isn't going to be good and finally i said okay now brad what i did instead of going to the bridge a lot of times what i would do and this is something i learned in songwriting boot camp is you would you would go like for instance a lot of times you can take the b section you can take the music from the B section and use that as a bridge, but don't do the vocals over it and have the guitar mimic the melody that the voice was singing and play that over the bridge and then go into the chorus. And the guitar will still play the B verse melody and will continue playing into the chorus. And it's a real good, rather than like, okay, we're going to, we're going to just vamp on. Well, you know, and you're soloing and there's no chorus changes and you're just playing a bunch of noodling you know you know so i said don't do that that stinks because he's such a great guitar player my god he's world class and so after he realized okay now brad here's what i want you to do okay now this is the part this is like when the panther is in the bushes and he's he's about ready to pounce and he sees the little baby deer come by okay when the bridge comes in that's when you get to devour it you know and so he he's, well what about what do you think if i do this i said would you please do that oh that's what you want me to do yes oh man this is awesome and so when Kelly and Gary, I'm getting cold to sing about when Gary and and, and uh, Kelly came in, they heard his solo playing from when they opened the front door, and it was just a, it was like high fives. It was the Victor's locker room at that point. It's like we knew we were okay. And then um, David told me uh, a year or so later, he said Jeff Watson came up to me, and Jeff said. Uh, no, he, David said that Jeff came to David, and he said, no, Brad, here's what, Brad, Brad was still kind of doing a little blow, and Jeff had been doing a lot of blow, and he was now straight. He didn't want anything to do with it. After the record was over, and he was back in uh, the, East, East, uh, the East Bay in Concord, um, Brad sat down with Jeff. He said, I want you to hear this record. And he was like chopping up some lines and thought him and Jeff were going to like, you know, like start, you know, rap. like old yeah, time. Yeah. And Jeff said, no, 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 no. I'm, yeah. you, you knock yourself out. I'm going to listen. And he listened and he said, Brad, this is your best work. And Brad went, really? Yeah, but the producer, Brad, it's your best work. And then Brad eventually apologized. And of course, if a guy's going to ask for forgiveness or apologize, I'm fine. Let, yeah, no problem. And, um, and so you know that was it was all about nothing it was just so when you say more often than not what it is is my physical size and this my the strength of my personality a lot of times just kind of uh, i guess challenges some people that don't want to be challenged um and you know you you just it 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 comes with the territory. There's only this is the only way I know how to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm so, not the so strong, Dave, silent so, type. <laughs> so David's contribution to, to this was it was huge. his record, and then and then and then then he went on tour with Night Ranger. Well, David did all the rhythm guitar. Brad did none of it. Yeah. So all the guitars. Did David do any lead on it at all, or no, was it just rhythm? No, just rhythm. No, hell no. And Brad, when they went on tour, did you ever hear about this? Uh, no. That Brad disconnected two of the speakers in David's cabinet because David was saying, every time I kick into to play, there's something's wrong, you know. <laughs> and his, but they, because they, he knew David was that good. Or, or. I don't, it was kind of like the Brian Setcher was the same way. He'd do that kind of thing to you, and so. Um, it's pretty petty. Pretty petty, isn't it? <laughs> so you said it, I did. So, um, but I saw some of the shows, and you know, David. David was such a team player. I mean, God bless him. You know, God rest his soul. 
I mean, he he uh, he was he just did a great job, and he played the piano on Sister Christian. He did the intro and all that, and he sang. So now he had four part harmony, and so they were great. That was a great band, but it got very very obvious that they were hitting the clubs three times a year instead of two and they were playing the same circuit and the money wasn't did, getting any did better. Did they come through Waco at the time? They, yeah, they came... Well, no, they came through when when Jeff came back and Jack came back. But Yeah, they did. They played the Hippodrome. They sure did. Yeah. With they, David. Yes. Mm-hmm. They played that in like... Must have been 96 or 97. And uh, uh, David did that. Yeah, that would have been awesome to see that show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was a good show. Mm. Cool, but, man. Uh, you know, and so that brings us in. We're into, gonna have to charge you overtime. I think this, <laughs> this will probably go on record. This will go on record as the longest in the shed, in the history of in the shed. Well, I'm sure you're gonna chop out a lot of the stuff. That, no, there's nothing to chop out, man. All this is great. Might, it's all awesome. We, we might make a two parter out of it, but yeah. Well, then you got to get into the Texas Hippie Coalition, and that's where it gets interesting. Let, let's yeah. talk about Texas, Hi- Texas Hippie Coalition real quick, because David played on some of that stuff, David too. played on Roland. He played all of Roland. What he, is that? Is that the name of the album? Mm-hmm. I, 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 R-O-L-L-I-N. I don't know much about about those guys. So, Well, it's THC. <laughs> what does that stand for? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the first record was called Pride of Texas, P-O-T. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> So they and, I, and let me just their, say you this: did their, you did their first album and their second album. I did way more than that. I did a lot of. And this record. is done from Salado. Did you actually record this? No, I did this in Allen. Okay, Allen. I was living in Allen at the time, and I met them at a studio. And when I met them, these guys. That was. I always said when I come back in the industry after my hiatus, when I was out, when I when I went to boys camp. Um, that I, I said, if I come back, I'm going to come back, and you're not going to respect me. You're going to fear me. And I said, I want a band that, that I want them to come in and scare the shit out of everybody, and then I want to walk in behind them like, now what are you going to do? Yeah. And that was THC. I mean, that's the most intimidating bunch of guys you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> it was like it was like a band, you know. I mean, it's like they came in with animal skins on them and ammo belt strong. <laughs> It looked like they had been out and fighting in the in the mountains of Afghanistan, you know. Um, they were just rowdy, rowdy boys from uh, Denison, Denison Sherman, North Texas, about five minutes from the uh, Red I, River. I remember you telling me that David recorded some lead parts for one of the albums. He recorded uh, all, I would say, out of maybe the... Uh, ten solos or nine solos on the record. David, which, David which, did which eight. Record? The first, their first album, or second? no, not on. The, he didn't have anything to do with the first record. He let me use his studio a little bit to mix it. I was trying to work with a band of his called Critic Hill at one point. Yeah, and uh, so after I did that, then I was trying to do. I was trying to start mixing THC, but and then I lived in Salado. I mixed THC in Salado. In just a tiny little bedroom, I just put some curtains around me, and, and there wasn't enough room for a person to sit in there except me. And I just so, so how did David get involved with with uh, well, I mean, uh, I, the way David got involved was um, the guitar player in the band um, had had a bunch of nerve damage <laughs> to his left arm, and so he's playing a floating tailpiece. So you, if you know, if you've ever played a guitar like that, your, your touch with your left hand is everything. And he couldn't feel. So his intonation was just out, out to lunch. I mean, you could tune a guitar on an open E chord and you could, you know, it, it shows up on the strobe tuner and it's perfect. And then he would play an open E chord and it was out of tune. And, and, I, <laughs> and so I said, Dave, you got to come in. I mean, and, and he was furious that I couldn't give him any credit because they couldn't do a record where THC. So did you, know, you tell the band that hey, I'm going to bring a friend of mine in to do the lead parts, or did you, did you just take it upon yourself? Well, I just it? had I, it was collusion, man. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll take it. just to yeah. be my last. Awesome. Yeah, I'll do this. So anyway, what happened is that. Um, 
I just got the manager and I got the lead singer together who was, you know, it was mine and the lead singer's band, really. I mean, it was him and I always together. And Rich, Big Dad. And um, they played here in Waco at the convention center a couple of years ago. I heard that. I, you know, we, I, we, we snuck in the back door <laughs> right, right at the end of their gig. Yeah. They're pretty rowdy. Yeah. Uh, I, but I mean, I was there in the beginning. Those were, that that was the good day. It was a, it was a uh, tattoo festival. Yeah. What was going on? And they were they were the band. Right? Yeah, they, they, they we did a lot of biker rallies and stuff like there that. There was a lot of PWT there at that show. P poor white trash. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, I mean that's that's their that is their that is their trade craft, man. Yeah. You know. Uh, I mean, you don't want a bunch of people driving up in Lexus to their shows. <laughs> you want some old, like, 79 C10 GMC <laughs> yeah, pickups yeah. and, and bikes, you With know. rebel flags oh, flying high. God, God. But anyway, um, if it, I, I couldn't give him any credit. I said, David, I'm paying you really well, you know, but, I mean, you know, uh, God, I'm practically paying you by the note, you know. Um so anyway, that you know, they had some songs on the radio. Was it from that album? Th uh, they had some from the first one, and then uh, they had some from the third one, the one that they did with Bob Marlett in California. Because another record company came in, and they decided they wanted a real producer, <laughs> you know. And I thought, you guys, a bunch of yabos. This guy owns a construction <laughs> company in Amarillo, and he, and his favorite band was uh, Cross Canadian Ragweed. Oh Lord, <laughs> give me a break! I mean, really? Come on, man. Can I, can I get an amen? And uh, and so anyway, uh, they've had a different producer every record, and then the last record they did was uh, just weird. Yeah. And each record has gotten progressively further away from what they were. And really? So, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, I because it they were they were pretty much. I, I guess you would call them biker rock, in a way. I mean, well, they were called. Uh, they, the, we came up with the the red dirt metal. That was the yeah, yeah. the thing, and then yeah, everybody it was red cock metal. Yeah. <laughs> the first record was amazing, and I tell you what got us over. What really put us over is when we did the Jerry Springer show in two thousand eight. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that was the wildest. Were you thing. there? Did yeah, you, to, you were to the show. Yeah, I went. To, oh, I was man, in Chicago, I, I and I was in up. the I was in the uh, the production suite because they did, had all the cameras. Throw, anybody throw a chair at you or fist fights going on or anybody pregnant? That, did you ever see it? No. Oh my God! I haven't watched Jerry Springer in years. Well, a lot of people saw it, and we started moving a lot of product. I mean, th oh, thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, there's some days to where it was like five thousand dollars in that day. Some weeks, seventeen, twenty thousand dollars. So they they sold a lot of downloads, sold a lot of merchandise. I mean, they've made a ton of money. No such thing as bad publicity. Not anymore. Not anymore. Well, well if that's the case, then I, <laughs> I should be Donald Trump. Jeez. Let's talk I'll about, vote for you. Let's talk about what you're working on now. You, you're working on a band out of... Uh, well, the management company that I got involved with, I had I discovered THC, and I took under, them under my wing. And while I lived in Chile for a year, and I would come back to the United States periodically. You can only stay 90 days on your uh, tourist visa. So anyway, I, I was in Wales, and I was in Santiago, Chile, and then when I came back, I said, guys, I wanted to get you a release and distribution in Europe, but it's just not going to happen, so I'm going to do the record, and we're going to do it ourselves. And I did, and I released it through CD Baby, and it started, the first checks came in, oh, it's $126, and the second one comes in, it's 111 the third one comes in, it's 180 you know, you get paid once a, once a week. And then all of a sudden it started climbing and climbing. And then all the reviews were five stars. Best thing I've ever got, damn man, Pantera. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. man, this rocks. And then we did the Jerry Springer show and it was, whoop, you know, yeah, it just yeah. went through the roof. And, um, uh, so I did all the shows with them. I wound up having to play drums for them because their drummer was just such a misfit. Golly. <laughs> I mean, he was always, he you know, he, you never knew if he was going to show up. One time we did a gig in Chicago, he showed up with three sticks. 
I said, you realize what's going to happen. You, you've got one extra. And if you break one after that, you know, I, I don't know what to do, pal. Yeah, you know? play with your hands, I guess. And uh, he just, it, it was just the craziest damn thing I've ever seen. So anyway, as Cowboy, I mean, he fit the band really well. But eventually they had to let him go because he was just such a mess. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, what happened was um, I played about 15 or 20 gigs with them. Then they started getting uh, other drummers coming in. I'd have to teach them the songs and stuff. And then th this other company came in and bought out everyone's interest. And so I did the second record with them. And after that, it was, I'll see you, you know. And I still get royalties from that. But um, now got some other things in the fire. And the management company that, that I financed the band. I mean, I kept it going during the darkest days. And um, so now, you know, they're, you know, they probably do 150, 200 dates a year. They, and, you know, they work a lot. They make good money. And then um, now I've got a, a thing that I'm working on with uh, the management company out of Oklahoma City, a guy named Ryan Hall, a guitar slinger from New Orleans. And he's really interesting he's, because he was there for Katrina. You know, he's a white, red-headed kid. Did he he's, do some stuff with, with Zacek? Yes. Yeah, D yeah, David did the whole, that was the last yeah. really formal record. I remember him telling me about that. Yeah. yeah, now he did, now I know that he did some stuff with the Mojos and, and with, with his sons and stuff like that, but this is a real record, you know. I mean, and uh, David played bass on the whole thing. And he was sick, and it was sad, you know. Um, and I, I said, David, look, you, you need to work. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with your treatment. Um, you know, he had he had the bag at that point. Um, and yeah, we had him in the shed. Um, actually, he was our first interview. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had him in. The first one, we were swatting beers. Mm -hmm. If you ever listened to the first one. And then um, he was... Um, the, the next he was drinking did. distilled water the next time we came yeah, in. Yeah, he was sick by that time. This was... Yeah, uh, was, this was uh, yeah, you were lucky if you could get more than 30, 45 minutes of trot. Well, that's... The the, the, the music video that I just won the, at right. the MACT Award right. mm -hmm. is him playing that in mm -hmm. the shed. He played that song. Oh, okay. In, he played that song here. Mm -hmm. And I took the video yeah. that we shot... Well, I see. Stuff. I didn't even yeah. know that he was doing any of that stuff until we were at his at his uh, uh, memorial service, and I saw him. Yeah. I went, "Oh Lord!" Yeah, <sighs> yeah it was a great that's, video. That's tough. Uh, Troy did an awesome video. Yeah, you do good work, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, you get you're talented. So um, anyway, that we finished the mix today. The guys in, in, that I worked with in, in Santiago, Chile, are the greatest people in South America. This is the guy you're talking about from New Orleans? Or yeah, but I, I, what was happening, I've got a new Pro Tools rig, and I'm just having fits, you know, really getting my bearings with it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated scenario. It's a complicated software system because it's the latest one. It's Pro Tools 12, and so it's, I mean, my God. They want to change stuff and move stuff around, make it more complicated than it has to be. Well, it's it's it, it, it quite literally, and I know the team that developed it. David LeBolt and I are good friends, and so I remember he called me in '92 and wanted me to play drums on this thing that he had called uh, Digit Designs, you know, and it, digital recording. And I said, David, I'm I'm not playing much, and I don't have any time. I'm sorry. So you know, when I look back, and I'm done. you know, I'm done. God, it just be a. Um, I mean, you know, and because it started with the original 001 and 002 and then the inbox, and then they kept building and building, and, you know, I mean, now it's a juggernaut. But anyway, um, so the thing is, Pro Tools is literally tools. It's, it's you can pretty much, if, if you get really facile and familiar with the command and the protocols and so on and so forth, you know, you have to be very meticulous in your file management and how you label things. If you don't, oh my God. So what do you prefer, 
the way music is recorded now on computers and you can really add everything you er, any effect well you let me want tell you to, something or do you prefer like you did in in the uh, the firehouse days well the way there's a guy named Chris Lord Algae CLA is what he's called and uh, he had a brother Tom who was an engineer and did all a bunch of big records in New York and he was a co-produced uh, in the high life with Stevie Winwood, and uh, then he he hasn't you know he hasn't been as active, but there was a Jeff Lord Algae, the younger brother, but Chris is the one that really came to the forefront and went to Los Angeles from New York. And the way that he works is he works with the SSL four thousand series board with E series EQ, and he works with the Sony thirty three forty eight machine, which is a half inch tape digital tape, and it's forty eight tracks. But it only records at two sample rates, 44, 1, and 48. And it's 16 bit. But it sounds amazing. It sounds better than tape ever did. I mean, sounds better than a Neve board. Well, he, the he, the SSL he runs the he runs the Sony through the SSL. He's he's basically operating exactly like we did 40 years ago, literally. And he's doing all the records. And um, the way he does it is people will send him their sessions, their WAV files for their album. And if it's more than 48 tracks, he will create stems. He'll say, okay, well, these, I don't need individual tracks for this. I'll just make mixes of that and import it instead of it being eight tracks. I'll take it down to two or four. And he'll get his reel filled up with 48 tracks and then he'll mix it. So a lot of guys, in my opinion, the you, well, there's two ways you can work. You can work in the box, meaning that you record into your computer and then you do everything in your computer. You mix in your computer and then you take it out and you'll either master it yourself or you'll send it to some of these guys that are now doing decent work mastering. And then you'll either make a CD with it or vinyl or just do downloads. Then there's other people. They record into the computer. And then out of the computer, they use the computer like a tape machine and then run the output to the computer into a console. And that really is where you can, that's the best of both worlds. But you have to, to have one of those consoles, I mean, they take an enormous amount of utilities. Just to have an SSL, just your electric bill is going to probably triple. You know, I mean, and it generates an enormous amount so of heat. Let's compare to the way stuff is recorded now and the stuff recorded like in the 70s you know zeppelin and stuff you know now you you mix it and then you master it how was mastering done back then completely different there was no such thing as volume you made if you if you're if you're trying to cut a record of an acetate you had to go to these very sophisticated uh, almost like a hospital were those kind of records actually mastered yeah uh, no but they were mastered back with a whole bunch of gear that was made in switzerland and austria and they were lathe l-a-t-h-e lathe and um they used to used to could they would take these acetate blanks and they're about a quarter minute thick you can't bend them and they were they were warm just slightly warm so the stylus which was also warm would cut a groove and, and, and you could watch it cutting. They had a little magnifying glass and you could see it. Every now and then you have to go over to it and blow the shavings off because it was cutting. Um, and it had a lot of gases, you know, that were hooked up to it that was injecting into the lathe. And it was a very complicated machine. But you couldn't make a record loud. It was, you could only get to a certain point and that was it. Because if it was any louder, it would skip. So... You know, there was Bob Ludwig was the big guy, and then Ted Jensen and 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 Bob, uh, Greg um, George Marino. He died, but uh, Ted and Bob were the big guys, and you had Bernie Grunman in L.A. and a couple of other guys. There was probably a dozen really uh, A-list mastering guys, and you know, I mean, most of the time you weren't allowed. I mean, you had to pay extra to be there and physically you know be witnessing the mastering of the record and basically they didn't do a lot they didn't do a lot of compression or eqing is very subtle very yeah. subtle not like now where they compress the hell out of everything well but they're getting away from that they're having to because i, I just found this out that that when you send stuff or put stuff on youtube it's automatically um 
if they decrease the volume 60 big I mean it's just gotten so obscene yeah and and um, there's a certain level that you have to get in order to where it sounds good driving the amplifiers and cars you know if you have to if you have to turn the amp all the way up in a car to make a record sound good then your CD's too quiet you know and most people don't know how to do that to make a, a decent level on a CD it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to learn and you know you just have to really get in there and fail a let lot. me tell you man, I can talk to you about music production all night that's a whole nother episode of in the shed but i think we need to wrap this sucker up we're at two and a half hours <laughs> <laughs> I, hope yeah. I, I hope when i hit save on this thing uh i have it enough doesn't hard drive. go like I, not I, enough. I have enough hard drive space so not let's, let's wrap dish. this show up hey david we want to really thank you for being here tonight well, thank you for, for putting up time. with me oh man we, david we've learned a lot an honor. i mean i've learned shit i didn't know <laughs> i needed to learn <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to keep it s stupid, simple, but no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, to help you guys however we, I can. We really know. appreciate you being here tonight. All right, buddy. All right, man. Hey, and <laughs> that's did. one more episode of In the Shed, and we'll see you guys next time.